For All Mankind by Matthew O'Connell. Exterior, Atlantic Ocean, night, stars, billions of brilliant points of pure, perfect light strike out against an eternal abyss. Out here, the horizon doesn't exist. There's no distinction between the clear sky and crystal water, each bursting with bright, colorful, cosmic scenery. Fluid nebulas drift through the deep, dark, infinite stellar background, overlapping shapes, colors, auras, some mimicking the shapes of men or beasts. Concentric ripples cut through the serene surface of the water, warping the stellar scenery. An overloaded, weather-beaten UK dark-class military patrol boat charges towards the ripples. Superimpose, Atlantic Ocean, 1959. Exterior, boat deck, night. A handful of hardy crew members rush around, hard-faced men in beards and uniforms, each with a task to do. The boat begins fighting against rough waves, bouncing off the water's surface and splashing back down. Soon, high waves smash into the hull, and the small vessel rocks side to side. Amidst a flurry of activity, one man sits seemingly unconcerned, his head buried in an array of strange machines and maps which he fights to contain on an improvised desk. This man, Arthur Calloway, 55, is fit, stern, and focused, with salt and pepper hair and a pencil-thin mustache. His eyes trace a path on a waterlogged topographical map. He references his findings in a dog-eared textbook, then against columns of readings in a small journal. He turns back to his map, dissatisfied. Interior, boat bridge, continuous. In the compact control room at the top of the boat, a broad-shouldered Scotsman with bright orange hair and thick wool wardrobe has his eye focused dead ahead through a monoscope. Captain Sean Horn, 50, sees something that causes concern. He glances at Arthur below, fiddling with his instruments. Arthur scrambles for a small round device with a face like a clock, a barometer. This gives him a measurement he likes. He then finds another device, an EMF meter. On the bridge, Captain Horn's attention turns from Arthur to the rising waves. His callous voice cuts through the chaos. All right, lads, the chop is too thick. Bring her on full. The crew begin their revised tasks with great relief. Exterior, boat deck continuous. Arthur feels the ship turning. He looks up at the bridge and meets Horn's stern eyes. Arthur gathers up his maps and notebook and brings them with him as he strides to the bridge with purpose. Interior, boat bridge, continuous. Arthur bursts into the cabin. Find your original bearing, Captain. We're nearly there. Arthur opens his notebook and shoves it towards Captain Horn, pointing to a series of digits that are clearly meaningless to the captain. Look, don't you see? We found it! Captain Horn hands him his monoscope and points. Arthur aims, adjusts it, squints. There's a swirling disturbance in the water several leagues ahead. It's a hazy area generating diffuse light, a spot where the waves and whipping winds circle around a central point and the surface of the water turns concave. The ocean spirals around this point, its current completely altered for the surrounding square mile. Arthur grins, Horn grimaces. The eye of the storm, Mr. Calloway. We're only headed to our deaths if we stay on this path. We'll return when it clears. Arthur hands the scope back to Horn. This is not the eye of the storm, Captain, because this is not a storm, and it's not going to clear. Arthur grabs Captain Horn by the collar and puts his face inches away from the captain's. Full speed ahead. Arthur releases him and exits the cabin. Horn contemplates for a moment, surveying the terrifying path ahead, while two young crew members look to him anxiously. Not tonight. Captain Horn grabs the wheel and throttle, preparing to turn around. He turns to his left to address Emil Thrush, 45, an overweight man whose plump face and pale skin make him look younger than his years. Emil, tend to Major Calloway on the deck. Horn looks down at the deck where Arthur fishes around in a duffel bag. Tend to him. Make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. Restrain him if you have to. A crash of thunder is followed by a massive wave crashing over the bow. Everyone on the bridge loses their balance momentarily. Captain Horn recovers and grabs the wheel. Move! Emil departs. Horn struggles with the vessel, pushing it against waves and wind. It rocks and tips. The boat rides a wave along the end of the spiral, pulled along with the current. Captain Horn grunts and pulls at the wheel and flares the throttle. But it's hopeless. You may get your wish after all, Calloway. Buckle down, mates, to the center of the storm. Tonight we sail towards glory or fiddler's green. Horn looks down at the deck where Arthur has removed his shirt and pants to reveal a scuba suit below his clothes. Sweet Mary, mother of God, he's lost his mind. Exterior, boat deck, night. Emil descends the slick steps to the deck as huge waves crash over the sides. Only a couple of crew members remain outside, battening down the hatches. On the starboard side, he finds Arthur strapping on his final flipper. They shout over the wind and rain. You shouldn't be out here. Arthur steadies himself against the rail that lines the deck. What the bloody hell are you doing? Competing my mission! I can't let you do this, Major! It's suicide! I suspected Captain Horn might try to stop me. But you? 
I never knew you to steer clear of a storm. Another wave crashes over the side, drenching them. The eye of the storm draws closer. A multicolored vortex rises high into the night sky, blurring the stars, emanating a prism of murky colors, sucking in the wind and rain and waves like a vacuum. It looks like a black hole in the middle of the ocean. The boat is only 100 yards from it, riding the rim of the vortex, drifting closer as it spirals. Return to the bridge, Emil. Emil shakes his head. Not without you. Arthur places the breathing nozzle in his mouth. He leans down to the deck and picks up a harpoon. Emil reaches under his jacket, perhaps for a gun. A huge disturbance below the surface of the water lifts the boat from the port side, tipping it towards starboard. Arthur is thrown overboard towards the wild, foaming waves, losing his harpoon as he is consumed by the water. A massive black creature breaches the surface. Tough to tell as it thrashes around, but this sea monster emerging from the depths is more than 80 feet long. It looks like a whale crossed with some prehistoric animal, black and scaled and rough, with one end tapering off into a spiked tail and the other opening into a massive jaw. The creature surfaces and pursues the boat as it bobs along the waves. Its starboard hull is destroyed, shredding aluminum hanging like scabs. Emil scrambles for safety as the barrage rips the ship apart. Crew members slide across the deck and flail, and some are thrown overboard. Exterior, under the surface, night. Below the surface, rain and waves create a violent turmoil. Scales slither past gracefully, seemingly endlessly, as the sea monster navigates the froth expertly. Sinking deeper, the turmoil subsists slightly. The foam and debris decrease, and it gets darker and quieter. A beam of light shoots through the darkness, sweeping back and forth frantically as it sinks. It's attached to Arthur's chest. As the water settles, he regains control. He looks above for a sign of the boat, but sees only turbulent darkness. Lightning strikes above the surface, illuminating shadowy movements amidst the debris and waves. Arthur checks the compass on his wrist. It spins rapidly, never settling on a cardinal direction. With his first effort to swim in his chosen direction, a dark shape brushes past and bumps into him, knocking him off balance. He reacts defensively, but the mysterious entity quickly disappears. He regains his equilibrium and heads in his chosen direction. He soon spots something ahead, sparkling prisms of light emanating from a central source. Millions of colors, mixed together, shining in every direction, spinning through the vortex of water. As he approaches, the rainbow of light gets brighter. He swims into the spectrum of light, kicking through the colors. They drift in part ways around and mixing and mingling with the water like translucent fluids. Arthur moves the viscous colors with his hands, watching them separate, dissipate, reappear. He's momentarily mesmerized by this strange atmosphere. He pushes on towards the brightest point below. A sunken Victoria-era clipper ship rests on the ocean floor, decayed and torn up with all the earmarks of a centuries-old shipwreck. Arthur retrieves his EMF meter and takes readings, seeing the dial elevate as he gets closer. He pulls himself along the planks on the ship, shafts of light emanating from within it. He rips a board off the deck and squeezes inside. A large neon blue shark-like shape with tentacles slips past in the background. Arthur doesn't notice. He follows the light to its source, navigating the ship's interior to a large cabin. On the floor of the cabin, amidst a pile of artifacts and rotted wood, he finds a steamer trunk. He pries open the trunk, revealing deteriorated books, lamps, and some valuables, including gold coins and jewelry. Deeper inside the trunk, he finds a small, handmade, gilded box. He clears the debris and cautiously reaches for it. He opens it slowly. An involuntary grin appears on his face. He scrambles through his utility belt, finding the largest pocket, and withdraws a heavy black metal case. He opens the case, lined in layers with various types of metals. Whatever he removes from the gilded box, he seals inside his black case. Exterior, above the surface, night. Arthur breaks through the surface of the water near the rim of the spiral, fighting the strong current that tries to pull him into the vortex. Wreckage sweeps past him, large pieces and small, enough to convince us that the ship he came in on is likely destroyed. An oar levitates over to him. Come on! Arthur grabs the oar. Emil holds the other end and pulls him onto a life raft that holds him and three other crewmen, each green young men in their twenties. Arthur strips off his mask. You are batty. You know that? Arthur looks at the survivors, each drenched and frightened. Captain Horn, refuse to leave the bridge. Arthur lets out a heavy sigh. The downside of valor. A scrawny young deckhand, twenty-two, speaks up. That thing is still out there. What will we do? We, we haven't got any weapons, maps, anything. Pull yourself together. Blithering like a baby won't help. Emil chuckles. You think this is funny? He never stops surprising me. I... We're gonna die out here. Row, boy, as hard as you can. Forget about the water and whatever lurks below. Look above. 
Arthur points towards the stars, singling out a particularly bright one to the north. That is your beacon. That is home. That's all you know. The deckhand sticks his oar in the water. We ride the current until we get enough momentum to slingshot out of the spiral and hope to God that gets us away from that creature as well. Until then, stay strong. And pray that today is not your last chance to prove you're a man. Exterior, Rosentendra, day. In an icy, dreary landscape, sparsely spotted with dead trees, mud, and frozen lakes, one object sticks out like a sore thumb. A green M4 Sherman U.S. Army tank, brandishing a bright American flag, frozen stiff. A hissing noise increases in pitch and volume, gradually, then more quickly. The Army tank explodes. Superimpose? Russia. The flaming wreckage settles in the reflection of a pair of binoculars, lowered to reveal two steel-gray eyes. These eyes reside in the scarred, weather-beaten face of Vladimir Blazanov, 50. He's as serious and as Russian as they come. His dark gray military peacoat is lined with black fur that matches his hat. His rigid back and thick frame demand submission. Reload. On one knee on his left side is Archiam Avalov, 24, a young soldier holding a shoulder-mounted RPG-2 rocket launcher. But Colonel, all the targets are destroyed. Indeed, piles of flaming wreckage and tank skeletons are all that remain in the field. Hesitation and mercy are the hallmarks of failure. You have ruined your enemy with your first blow. Lazanov looks into Artyom's eyes. Now we destroy the rules. Artyom reloads. Fire! Lazanov watches the rocket, then turns to his trainee as it erupts in the field ahead. Return to barracks. As Artyom packs up his weapon, a high-ranking officer approaches. Stout and broad-shouldered, the plump, bearded General Ustinov, 60, is almost as serious as Blazanov, but his stride and stature are less intimidating. Nonetheless, Blazanov straightens his back and salutes him. General? Colonel Blazanov, you have been reassigned effective immediately. A new campaign. You will be briefed on site. Departure is at 0400 for your briefing at Site Omega. Does this order come from you, General, or elsewhere? This order comes from the Kremlin, and all eyes are on you as you undertake it. This is as close to the front lines as we can get you, Colonel, when your enemy hides in the shadows and operates in stealth. Glazanov nods. I am honored to serve. Exterior, Russia's extreme north, day. Sun reflects off ice in this blinding, abandoned Arctic landscape. A dark green armored M3 half-track bearing the Russian flag chips away the top layer of snow and ice for traction. The vehicle slows to a stop in front of a solitary snowbank. The driver's door opens and a Russian soldier steps out, every inch of him covered to avoid exposure. He approaches the snowbank, which is about as big as a garbage truck. The soldier withdraws a radio from his belt. He clicks the transmitter on the radio, holds it a moment, then releases. He repeats this two more times, and waits. Mechanical sounds emanate from within the snowbank. Heavy machinery groans into motion. The front portion of the snowbank shudders and jolts, then a perfectly square section of it rises. A steel elevator emerges like some kind of strange foreign cube from the subterranean complex. The soldier signals to the truck. The passenger door opens and another soldier in an identical uniform emerges, carrying a duffel bag. This man matches the proportions of Lazanov. He proceeds past the first soldier without a word, steps into the elevator, and hits the single red button. The elevator jolts as it recedes back into the ground. Interior, underground Russian complex, day. Lazanov strips away his hood, mask, and goggles as he proceeds down a large empty corridor of concrete and stainless steel. Ahead of him, the hallway branches to the left and right. Straight ahead is a large door with transparent windows. Inside is what looks like a laboratory. Lazanov removes his gloves as he approaches the door. He peers inside, seeing a large room with a handful of lab technicians in white coats, all too dizzy to notice him. He enters a four-digit combination into the lock, and the door clicks and unlocks. This gets the attention of the technicians. Interior, laboratory, continuous. Five lab techs stand in silence, all eyes on Blazanov. He unzips his coat, revealing his uniform and rank. All of the lab techs stand at attention and salute. Where is Ms. Petrovich? Ivana Petrovich, 50, a confident, wiry woman with uncombed hair and a wrinkled lab coat, steps forward. Here, Colonel. Gather your research. You will brief me immediately. She nods and hurries towards her station. As she gathers her papers, Blazanov addresses the remaining four lab techs. What is the compliment of this station? An overweight, bearded lab tech responds. Eight, Carl. Five technicians, two security personnel, and one for the maintenance. And what is the purpose of your research? You don't know? The lab tech swallows, unsure how to answer. We are charged with uncovering the properties of the artifact. 
Lesnov is confused for a moment, then his eyes go wide. I am ready, Colonel. She gestures towards an antechamber which juts out of the main laboratory. Lesnov follows her through a locked door, down a narrow corridor, and into a small elevator. She inserts a key, turns it, and pushes the button for the bottom floor. Interior, holding room, continuous. The doors open to a large room with concrete floors and walls. It's empty aside from a conference table, chairs, and at the far end, a large lead case atop a pedestal. It looks almost like a museum exhibit, if you weren't supposed to see the actual piece on display. Ivana gauges Blazanov's reaction and remains silent. Blazanov approaches the pedestal slowly, leans over the case, holds his breath. This is it? She nods. Is it safe to open? Briefly. We just can't permit extended exposure. Blazanov carefully lifts the lid. A small black rectangular artifact is inside, situated in a custom housing. It's about four inches long and only half an inch thick with a dull matte finish. Light parallel grooves line two sides. Blazanov reaches for it. I don't advise holding it, Colonel. He picks it up, turning it in his hands, entranced by it. Do you have faith, Miss Petrovich? <coughs> Sir? Do you kneel before God? Do you feel him in your heart? Mm, I suppose not, sir. Blazanov nods. The skeptic, of course. A woman of sights. When I hold this artifact, I feel the power of God. It runs through me like a steady current. This is proof of higher powers. Higher, perhaps, but likely not divine. Are you the one who recovered it? Blazanov nods. Then it all makes sense. You are the one who is immune. Not the only one. Tell me, Miss Petrovich, why am I here? What have you learned? Exterior, Piccadilly Street, London, day. The city bursts with activity despite the midday rain. Flocks of busy professionals clog the popular downtown district. Superimpose, London. One woman's all-black ensemble stands out. Her auburn hair, red lips, and veiled hat brim with high-end taste, but her frantic high-heeled sprint belies her elegance. Mary Calloway, 35, splashes through a deep puddle, disregarding her finely tuned appearance to catch up to a taxi that idles nearby. A brutish 40-year-old man in a wool suit opens the door to the taxi and prepares to climb inside as Mary approaches. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. That's my taxi. I just hailed it right back there. He stopped for me. The man gives her a look of annoyance. There are plenty of others. I'm in a rush. <laughs> Excuse me. Do I look like I've nowhere to be? I've been out here more than ten minutes getting drenched. Please let me take it. Where's your umbrella? Well, I don't have an umbrella. It's none of your business, is it? Do you mind? He thinks a moment, then holds out his umbrella. Here, take mine. He puts it in her hand and climbs into the taxi. Hey, hey! I don't need your bloody umbrella. I, you don't. I just need the tax. The door shuts. Hey! She bangs on the door with the umbrella. The taxi takes off, spraying her with water as it goes. Standing, soaked, she watches it depart. A passerby, an older gentleman, senses her distress. Are you well, miss? May I offer... No! She shoves the umbrella at him and storms off. Exterior, Fairlawn Cemetery, Sussex, day. A pristine green field lined with neat rows of identical headstones. A military graveyard, dignified and manicured. About fifteen people gather around a casket draped with a Union Jack. A priest stands at the head of the casket reciting from a worn Bible. Solemn faces stare at the ground, mostly men in their fifties in full Royal Navy uniform, plus a handful of plainclothes civilians, some women in black, and a bagpiper in a kilt. Arthur is there. He wears a formal British Army uniform. His epaulets display the rank of Major. His dress greens bear a few decorations, including the Distinguished Service Cross and Service Medal. Arthur salutes as they lower the casket into the grave below the headstone, Captain Sean Horn. Scottish bagpipes play Amazing Grace. As the casket settles, the music fades and mourners disperse. Arthur lingers. His eyes follow the casket into the ground. Major Calloway. Elmer McGuinness, 70, stands behind him. A stiff old silver fox in a double breasted <coughs> suit. Elmer, you're not in uniform. It may have been proper, but it didn't seem it. At a certain point, it's time to move on. Perhaps I'm old fashioned. Elmer pays on a polite smile. Art, we need to talk. Exterior, Fairlawn Cemetery, Sussex, day. Arthur sits on a stone bench at the crest of a hill, surveying thousands of graves while the weeping willow keeps the sun out of his eyes. Behind him, the last of the funeral party departs, including Elmer McGuinness. Mary makes her way through the crowd to find Arthur. She's still damp. I'm so sorry, Father. I missed my train. She sits next to him. Was that Mr. McGuinness? Arthur nods. We've lost our royal liaison. 
our funding, our diplomatic privileges, all of it. Too much controversy, too much liability. She hangs her head and sighs. Did you tell him about the, the artifact? He can't be trusted. He's not loyal. And this is too big for him anyway. Perhaps it's for the best. Who could say how the British government, how any government, would handle this? Our discovery could easily be lost to bureaucracy or ignorance, or destruction. But we must continue. We'll find a private benefactor. There are plenty of wealthy families in England. I'm prohibited, blackballed. My work with SETI and the IGI had made me on the outskirts of the scientific community to begin with. This was the last straw. I don't imagine you're considering throwing in the towel. Of course not. She senses an uneasiness with him. But you're concerned. She turns to face him. He doesn't meet her gaze. You've been different for the past few months. I haven't been able to crack through and talk to you like we used to. It's felt as though there's a huge space between us. Arthur thinks for a moment. Our bodies, like all matter, are mostly empty space. Even when we touch, we're not touching. Not really. Mary tilts her head, not reassured. Everything in the universe is drifting apart, from the atom to the planets. That's why love and honor and loyalty matter so very much. Ideals are immovable and not bound to nature. These things make us human. They make us evolved and eternal. That's why you're so important to me. What are you saying? After what happened out there, it's clear to me that I can't keep you safe. And I need you to be safe. You're the only one who understands. I'd like you to remove yourself from these studies for a while. Perhaps spend some time in the country. As I pursue this, it might... Aren't you always preaching the greater good? The imperative of the mission above all else? What will sidelining me accomplish? Mary, dear, it's dangerous. We have enemies. We're, we are a target now. Without those resources, I, I, I can't protect you. Mary stands up, paces furiously. Maybe you don't need to protect the whole world and me as well. Maybe you need to let me in. Let me help. You have no idea what these people... Carry the cross if you must. But you need me. Look at you. You're falling apart. Arthur does look a bit pale. The bags under his eyes suggest a lack of sleep and surplus of stress. Mary calms herself through a slow, deep breath. She puts her hand on his arm. Even you have limits. Let me be your anchor. I want you to drift away. Arthur sighs. There's something else. I came straight from the lab. I haven't had a chance to tell you. I found something on the artifact. Arthur perks up. A clue? She can't help but grin. A message? Interior, Horton Research Facility. Mary's office, day. Mary wears thick rubber gloves as she carries a familiar lead box from a floor safe to a table. Her office is little more than four walls and clutter, surfaces piled with textbooks, maps, scientific instruments. Arthur moves a pile of clutter as Mary places the box down. You'd better do it. Arthur nods. He opens the box and lifts the artifact out. It's identical to the one in Russian possession, aside from slight variations in the grooves. They both hold their breath as he handles it. What now? She walks to the window and draws the curtains. She returns and drags a lamp across the table. From her desk, she retrieves a black light bulb. She removes the lampshade and replaces the light bulb with a black one and clicks it on, covering the desk in ultraviolet light. The UV light triggers three glowing symbols on the artifact. Brilliant. He studies the symbols. They're similar to stars and form a vertical, slightly off-center line. Of course it wouldn't be in the limited spectrum of light visible to us. Perhaps willfully. Perhaps. It's incredible, dear. Brilliant. You've done what dozens of great minds fail to do. But what does it mean? I don't know. But I know that we will learn its meaning before long. Mary smiles. You've got that spark back. Now we just have to find our benefactor. Well, if we've exhausted our resources here, perhaps we must go abroad. Oh, if you've got someone in mind. There is someone. I suppose it depends on how desperate we are. Interior, Pritchett Estate, bedroom, day. A naked man lies face down on a massage table. Two naked Asian women stand on top of him, a half-empty bottle of bourbon on the floor. They're in the center of an elaborately adorned bedroom, dripping with old money. Silk curtains cover floor-to-ceiling windows. Hand-carved decorative details trim the walls. Victorian furniture rests on cherry wood floors. The girls use each other for balance as they press their feet into the man's back, legs, and buttocks. He groans. Put your weight into it. You won't hurt me. 
Gerald Smith, 70, a stiff, proper butler in coat tails, appears in the doorway and clears his throat. The naked man, James Pritchett, 38, lifts his head. He's handsome with sandy blonde hair, a charming smile, and a southern accent. Jerry, you've decided to join us after all. Mr. Pritchett, you are needed on the rear lawn. I'm busy. I apologize, but Mr. Turner requires your presence. Pritchett sighs. What the hell is it? Exterior, Pritchett Estate, rear lawn, day. Pritchett, now clothed in a white linen suit, walks between two straight rows of cherry trees which form a path in the rear of the estate. Superimpose, Virginia, United States. Horace Turner, 60, a groundskeeper with a neatly combed beard, wearing rugged khaki attire, meets Pritchett outside a large greenhouse at the end of the path. It's a beautiful frosted glass building with high arches and a steel frame loaded with exotic plants. Inside the greenhouse is a commotion, glass shattering, pots breaking, strange shrieks and scratches. Pritchett sighs. Not again. A few others have gathered around the greenhouse, each older than Pritchett, each with a duty on the estate. A maid, 70, a chef, 65, a butler, 50. It, it broke loose from its enclosure and we can't lure it out. Why do we still have that thing, Horace? For that matter, why do I even have you here if you can't control it? What would you have me do with it, sir? How about a nice pair of boots? Your father would slap you. Give me the gun. Horace hesitantly complies. You've got no respect. She's a goddamn menace. Bridget checks the barrels and snaps it shut. He takes a deep breath and gathers his courage. Get the door. Horace places his hand on the door. Shrieks and bangs from inside the building respond to their actions. Pritchett inches closer, holding the gun in front of him, trying to hide his apprehension. He nods to Horace. Horace pulls open the door. Pritchett charges inside. Horace closes it behind him. Interior, greenhouse, continuous. Pritchett sweeps left and right with shotgun. It's a compact little jungle in here, misty and humid, with colorful exotic plants everywhere. Every surface is slick. Vines climb the walls. Thick bugs buzz around. A ruffle and flutter cause Pritchett to sweep left but he only catches a quick moment of movement before his target disappears behind the foliage. Pritchett proceeds cautiously further into the greenhouse. A loud crash causes him to jump back as a huge hanging plant falls from a steel rafter, hitting the ground nearby. Another abrupt shuffle causes some ruckus on the other side of a row of ferns. A huge clay pot jumps off a shelf, knocking Pritchett down. He scrambles to his feet as the scrapes and shrieks close in. A large figure steps in front of him and knocks him back again as he tries to rise. It slices his arm and he drops the shotgun. A creature's small, beige, beaked head rises. Red eyes stare bullets at Pritchett as it towers over him. An aggressive, eight-foot-tall ostrich, and it's angry. Pritchett breathes heavily, holds his arm, cornered and subdued. He lifts his head to look the giant bird in the eye. It squawks and struts, demonstrating its dominance. Pritchett lowers his eyes to the ground. The ostrich squawks again, then hesitates, and finally shuffles off, destroying countless more priceless plants as it continues its rampage. Exterior, greenhouse, moments later. Pritchett emerges, holding his arm. Let it tire itself out. Call Mayfield and have him bring more tranquilizer. Knock it out and put it back where it belongs. Horace gives him a confused look as Pritchett rushes past him without making any eye contact. Yes, Miss Pritchett. As Pritchett proceeds towards the house, Gerald greets him. Your guests have arrived, Mr. Pritchett. I told you, Jerry, call me James. Mr. Pritchett is dead. And I told you, Mr. Pritchett, I refuse. Pritchett smiles and puts his hand on Gerald's shoulder. Not right, now, Jerry. Did you prepare some mojitos? I'm sure my guests are thirsty after the journey. Yes, Mr. Pritchett. You can make one for yourself, too. I'm sick of being the only drunk guy around here. I'll have to decline. Thank you. Come on, let's get toasted. Make a day of it. Gerald grunts his disapproval. Interior, Pritchett Library, day. Dark wood decor with white columns, leather books, marble busts, crystal decanters, and great stuffed taxidermy beasts. Arthur and Mary stand in the center of the room, too practiced in etiquette to be seated on the deep leather couch or club chairs before their host arrives. Mary is transfixed by a massive oil painting hanging above a stuffed brown bear, covering eight feet of wall at the head of the room. It depicts the mean-faced, white-bearded Samuel Pritchett, who, from the looks of it, must have been at least 150 years old at the time of the portrait. Even in death, he's more magnetic than me. Mary spins to see James Pritchett in the doorway. Uh, hard to look away. It takes control of the room. That's what he was known for. Me, on the other hand, 
Hell, I don't know if I've ever even been in this room. Pritchett has a bandage on his arm, which he secures as he crosses the threshold and sizes up the library. A stuffed jaguar stands on top of a credenza, prowling at eye level. Pritchett pats it as he approaches Mary and Arthur. It's been a long time, Miss Calloway. You're more beautiful than I remember. He takes her hand in his and kisses her knuckles. She can barely keep herself from rolling her eyes. Mr. Pritchett, may I present my father, the esteemed Major Arthur Calloway. Father, this is Lieutenant James Pritchett. Pritchett and Arthur shake hands. So you said. Nay, mostly South Pacific, Korea. Just a civilian now, though. Arthur spies a gun rack outfitted with antique rifles. Do you hunt? No. These are all my father's trophies. I was told he passed away recently. I'm sorry for your loss. Richard ignores the pleasantry to focus on Mary. I have to admit, Miss Calloway, never thought I'd see you again. All those letters I sent, not a single reply. Sorry to upset your expectations. Oh, honey. I've never been less upset in my life. Gerald enters with mojitos. Pritchett distributes them. Thanks, Jerry. Gerald rolls his eyes, but won't fuss in front of guests. As Gerald departs, Pritchett gestures for Arthur and Mary to sit on the couch and takes an armchair across from them. You come a long way on short notice. I gather it's urgent. Quite. We need your assistance. You mean you need my money? Yes, that's correct. We are mounting an urgent archaeological expedition and our funding fell through. An urgent archaeological expedition. Is there such a thing? It's complicated. Well, it's not really important. You come to call in a debt, right? We both know I owe you. Absolutely not. We're seeking voluntary contributions. I don't want my history to influence your decision. Our history is the only reason you're here. Arthur senses Mary's discomfort. Uh, Mr. Pritchard, this is a matter of international security. The delicate balance of power in the world could be easily disrupted if we fail to recover this artifact. Pritchett leans in, shifting from amused to captivated. What artifact? Exterior, Pritchett Estate, day. Two dark sedans skirt the outer edge of the estate, slowing to a stop just outside the perimeter. The front vehicle is packed with four Russian thugs, each dressed in inconspicuous suit and hat, grimacing eternally. The rear vehicle holds the two burliest of the bunch. Yuri Vladim, 25, is the bear behind the wheel. Neatly trimmed brown hair, broad shoulders, serious eyes, and a square jaw. Next to him is Anton Demenok, 28, nearly identical in appearance and demeanor. He looks through a pair of binoculars, scanning the estate. Interior, Russian compound, day. Lazanov follows Ivana down a long, concrete corridor. Its purpose is still unclear. We are unable to study the object directly. It's stronger than diamond, more dense than iron. She pauses at a large steel door, enters a combination into the lock, and continues through with Blazanov in tow. We have discovered potent electromagnetic emissions and levels of radiation which exhibit a similar half-life to uranium. Perhaps it is ammunition awaiting a trigger. Ivana shakes her head. Every hammer demands a nail. We have too little empirical data to classify it. Would you attempt to guess? A theory at this point would only stunt our progress. By eliminating our perceptions in any way, we could misunderstand its true purpose. A lack of conclusions after such rigorous study leaves us with one clear conclusion. This item is not of this end. A lack of conclusions is, by nature, not conclusive any of anything, Colonel. Perhaps I am more comfortable with ignorance than fallacies. Then tell me, Miss Petrovich, what have you been able to learn empirically about it? They come upon another large steel door. Ivana produces a key from around her neck and opens it. Interior, Russian compound, animal laboratory, moments later. Ivana guides Blazanov along a bank of animal cages, which line an entire wall of this small room, also filled with medical and scientific equipment. Many of the cages contain lab mice. Many of these lab mice are deformed. The subjects have been exposed to the artifact in varying degrees and proximity and in time. The mice have a much shorter lifespan and faster heart rate than larger mammals, so the effects are accelerated. Lazanov inspects them. The mice are in secure cages behind transparent plastic shields. We found an immediate growth in intelligence. We also found significantly shortened lifespan. The animals that were able to, to breed nearly always passed on their mutations to their offsprings, as if a spontaneous dominant gene was introduced and encouraged to spread th virally through the population. Further in, there are larger mice, the size of small cats. The subjects grew in nearly every way. 
muscle mass, bone density, even the thickness of their fur. Vision and hearing also improved. They reach a bigger cage at the end of the row, this one big enough for a large dog. Glazunov holds his breath. They are able to communicate. We don't know how. As in many primitive species, a pack mentality emerged. Soon, an alpha appeared. This creature has lived seven times the lifespan of the others. As they expire from radiation, sickness, or from autopsy, this one continues to grow stronger. Lazanov kneels in front of this mouse-like creature, the size of a medium dog. Fangs, red eyes, a long prehensile tail wrapped around its black, matted fur. Be careful. The tail shoots out of the cage, smacking Glazunov in the face before receding behind the bars, leaving Glazunov stunned. He grins. Spectacular. Have you studied this one? It's biology. Cell regeneration on an impossible level, and much more that we still do not understand. Glazunov stares into the cage, captivated. The Kremlin has seen fit to keep me removed from this for many years. Suddenly, it makes me very upset. This power properly understood and applied, could do incredible things for our military. Trained beasts, genetically evolved soldiers, the possibility... Of course you intend to weaponize it. But know that we are quite far from being able to understand it, let alone control it. Then why have we been going black in now? Presumably for your immunity to the artifact and the military nature of the operation we are dispatched to undertake. Plasnum raises an eyebrow. There are two remaining artifacts complementary to ours. Three items of this compound, harnessed and combined, could have incredible power. The power to transform the world. Our intelligence indicates that one was recovered only weeks ago from the Atlantic Ocean by an ex-military British major. Galloway. Correct. A team has been sent out to retrieve that artifact from him. I will lead that team. Negative. Your directive, with my assistance, is to recover the final piece of the puzzle so that we can complete our experiments and discover the true purpose of this relic. Where? Interior, Pritchett Library, day. An antique map of the world hangs framed on the wall behind a grand partner desk. Arthur stands in front of it, Pritchett and Mary at full attention. We owe our technology and the intellect in large part to a few ancient civilizations who make huge leaps in scientific discovery disproportionately influencing mankind. In a short window, they initiated written language, modern philosophy, geometry, astronomy. He points to Greece. Exterior, ancient Greece, montage, day. The cultural enlightenment of ancient Greece. The ancient Greek society of Athens, shown at its cultural high. Magnificent libraries of scrolls and parchment, beautiful marble structures, philosophers sharing the exhilarating conversations. The philosophical and artistic leaps made here between 800 and 400 BC were incomprehensible. Massive bronze and marble statues of exquisite godly men adorn great halls. The Acropolis sits atop the crest of a rocky cliff in pristine glory. The synthesis of civilized society emerging from the ashes of primitive worlds. Interior, Pritchett Library, day. Arthur checks to make sure Pritchett is keeping up. Likewise, the scientific prowess of the ancient Mayans. Exterior, ancient Maya, montage, day, night, scanning along oppressive stonework, temples, pyramids, statues, amidst a dense jungle teeming with life, the primitive population thrives in a vibrant ancient city. A highly developed civilization making scientific contributions well beyond the, what their place in history would dictate. Statues, sundials, and carvings pay tribute to revered creatures like serpents and jungle cats alongside human faces and symbols. The carved lid of the tomb of Kinich, Javan, Pakal, and the temple of the inscriptions among them, showing a demigod operating an impossibly complicated machine that some believe to be a vessel. Urban centers and star charts so sophisticated that the rest of the world took centuries to catch up. The first pre-telescopic civilization to discover Orion, a constellation that would factor heavily into subsequent theologies, the Dresden Codex, the earliest written text of the Americas, contains detailed astronomical calendars and tables, predicting celestial events with incredible accuracy. Interior Pritchett Library, day. His finger moves to Egypt. Ancient Egypt. Incredible advancements in agriculture, architecture, mechanics. This was where the first artifact was discovered in 1922 during the excavation of King Tutankhamun's tomb. The artifact? Arthur looks Pritchett in the eye. The one that will change the world forever. Arthur nods to Mary, and she retrieves a manila envelope labeled Top Secret from her satchel, handing it to Arthur. 
He withdraws a small stack of photographs, similarly stamped. The photos, dated throughout the 20s and 30s, show the very same artifact currently in Russian possession. It is placed next to scientists, rulers, lab equipment. This is the catalyst. Pritchett inspects the pictures. The next part will take a leap of faith, I'm afraid. Major, why don't we slow down for a moment? I made some calls when Mary reached out. I know you excused yourself from a tenure position at Cambridge three years ago. I know you've been recruiting since then, and your reputation has suffered. Some are saying you've gone mad. Is this worth destroying your life over, possibly ending it? Arthur nods. We haven't got a choice. Mr. Pritchard, have you ever felt so strongly about something that you'd sacrifice everything for it? Pritchard thinks for a moment. No. Isn't it about time you did? He smiles. Tell me, Miss Calloway. Will you be part of this expedition? Absolutely. Arthur looks surprised. You certainly will not. Of course I will. You're not a soldier, Mary. You're not trained. Continuing the research is one thing, but an expedition of this nature? I need you to be safe. Then we better not fail. She stares with steadfast determination. Arthur, exasperated, looks for an argument. Suddenly I have more confidence in this expedition. Father, show it to me. Dear. We have to. Arthur nods and glances towards the steel case. Mr. Bridget. All eyes dart to Gerald, standing in the doorway. Not now, Terry. I'm afraid it's urgent, sir. We have uninvited guests. Bridget cocks an eyebrow and proceeds to the window. Below, in the cul-de-sac in front of the house, a dark sedan squeals to a stop. Four armed men in suits pile out of it. Friends of yours? Bridget turns back to see that Arthur has opened his father's gun case and is loading a Winchester rifle. Sure, just help yourself. Blasimov's men. It must be. Well, how do they find us? I don't know. Who? Arthur pumps the lever-action rifle and walks over to the window next to Pritchett. We have to get out of here. Under no circumstances could these men get what's in this case. He smashes the window with the rifle and starts firing. The Russians fire back. Arthur pushes Mary to the ground as he fires. Pritchett ducks below the windowsill next to Mary. Jerry! Have Charlie get the car! Jerry disappears from the doorway back into the house. Gunshots ring out from below and blast through the window. Arthur returns fire, oblivious to the barrage of gunfire coming back at him. A scream and gunshots come from downstairs. The Russians have gotten into the house. Bridget pokes his head up over the windowsill, scanning the property, and sees the other car parked at the edge of it. He squints for a better look. Then his eyes go wide. Run! Bridget grabs Mary by the collar, and all three of them sprint for the door as a high-pitched whistle is heard. Moments before, a rocket-propelled grenade smashes through the window, strikes the wall, and explodes. The three of them tumble out into the hallway and onto the grand staircase, debris and flames and smoke blasting after them. Interior, Pritchett is safe hallway, continuous. Where's the car? Pritchett catches his breath while trying to come up with the answer. He looks back towards the study and sees a burning, gaping hole in the house littered with flaming heirlooms. Where's the car? The stuffed jaguar is on its belly, on fire, its head only a few feet away from Pritchett. He looks into its dark, dead, marble eyes as he responds. Carport, first floor, west wing. Mary retrieves the steel case from underneath some rubble, a bit roughed up, but still intact. Arthur discards the rifle and retrieves a compact Walter PPK pistol from his jacket. He keeps it pointed ahead of him as he leads them towards the staircase that leads to the first floor. A Russian charges up the steps. Arthur takes him out with one controlled shot to the chest. They climb over him and reach the bottom of the stairs. Interior, Pritchett Estate, main foyer, continuous. The maid is unconscious on the marble floor of the grand foyer, a bloody wound on her head. Poor as the groundskeeper is propped up against a chair on the floor, his shotgun on the ground, his chest bleeding. Pritchett rushes over to him. Horace, take it easy, we'll get help. Bugger off, boy. Horace lets out a long breath and passes out. Pritchett looks to Arthur and Mary, who are trying to act like they didn't witness the awkward exchange. Gerald comes out of another doorway nearby and whistles for Pritchett's attention. The card is ready, sir. Good, come with us. No, sir. I'll see to the staff. Chair. Get to safety, Mr. Pritchett. Pritchett glares at him, but doesn't argue. Which way? Pritchett points past them towards a long hallway. Interior, Pritchett estate, kitchen, continuous. They sprint down a long hall, spilling out into the kitchen and heading towards a door in the far corner. Look out! A Russian charges down the hallway behind them, firing. Pritchett drops to the ground as bullets bounce around him. Mary drops to one knee as Arthur swivels and fires back as the charging Russian soldier's bullets ricochet all around him. One grazes his cheek. Arthur's third shot takes him down. Let's move. Pritchett and Mary scramble to their feet and follow Arthur through the back door. Interior, Pritchett estate, carport, continuous. Dressed in full chauffeur attire from head to toe, Charlie Buckman, 35, a plump, cheery, red-faced fellow who looks like he'd be far more comfortable in a bar watching a game, tries to get a chauffeur jacket buttoned up. 
Oh, Mr. Pritchett. Forget the coat, you idiot. Start the car. Uh, do I need to prop, pop the trunk or boot for your things, Mr. and Mrs. Calloway? Just start the goddamn car. Charlie hustles into the driver's seat of the long black town car as Arthur boards the passenger side and Pritchett and Mary get in back. Go! Charlie hits the gas. Interior town car continuous. As they pull around the house towards the cul-de-sac, they see the fourth Russian infiltrator exit the house, get back into his dark sedan, and pursue them. Faster! Go! The other sedan, with Anton and Yuri, pulls up the edge of the driveway, blocking their exit. Charlie slows down. Come on! Put your foot down! Charlie hesitates. Arthur slides over and slams his foot down on top of his, gunning the engine. Hail Mary, full of grace! Arthur looks at Charlie as they accelerate. Charlie's eyes are almost completely shut and watering. Arthur grabs the steering wheel to make sure he stays on target. Exterior, Pritchett Estate, continuous. As they bear down on the car ahead of them, Yuri and Anton get out, each armed with Tommy guns. They fire at the town car, spraying glass through the windshield in a storm of bullets. Mary, Charlie, Pritchett, and Arthur duck and brace for impact. Charlie does the sign of the cross and puts his head down. The town car slams into the nose of the Russian car, sending Anton and Yuri flailing off the driveway to dodge the spinning car, which slides out of the driveway and lands in a ditch. The town car careens forward and spins, finally coming to a rest in the road. Its front end destroyed, its wheels transformed into mangled steel. Somehow, the crew was uninjured. Charlie looks up over the steering wheel and pats his essential organs to find everything in place. Hallelujah! He looks back to the driveway behind them to see the other Russian cars speeding towards them while Yuri and Anton collect themselves in the ditch. Shit! Charlie scrambles for the door. Charlie, don't! Stay in the car! Charlie ignores him, stumbles out, and runs. Anton fires, hitting Charlie in the back. Charlie falls to the ground. Son of a bitch! In the wreck, Mary landed partially on top of Pritchett. She pushes herself up, enduring an awkward position. She peeks out the back window and sees Anton reloading his Tommy gun. Arthur checks the ammunition in his pistol. Without a word, he opens the door and climbs out of the car. No, wait! Anton opens fire. Mary grabs the handle of the passenger side back door and kicks it open, catching the barrage of bullets meant for Arthur. Using the door as cover, Arthur fires at the oncoming vehicle, killing the driver. It rolls to a stop. Pritchett picks his head up, shedding glass and bullet shells. When the Tommy gun runs dry, he watches Arthur sprint towards the Russian car. He's certainly dedicated. He's going to get himself killed. I need a gun. Sorry, left it in the library. She climbs over him, momentarily straddling him. Can I give you a hand with anything? She rolls her eyes. She finds Arthur's steel case on the floor, opens it, and fishes through it, finding a 1911 Colt 45 pistol. She fires, blowing up the back windshield. Anton, out of ammo and out in the open, has a moment of panic before she hits him in the chest, killing him. Arthur uses the Russian sedan as cover from Yuri, the only remaining Russian. Yuri rushes the car, spraying it with bullets. Mary doesn't have a shot. Art's pinned down. He gets flat on his stomach and aims underneath the vehicle. He fires, taking Yuri down to knees. Arthur pockets his pistol as he walks over to Yuri, lying flat on his back and bleeding from his legs. Arthur kicks him in the face and takes his gun. Arthur pushes his foot into a bullet wound on his shin. Yuri screams. Where is he? Yuri grits his teeth in defiance. Arthur fires Yuri's weapon at the ground next to his head. Yuri screams. Where is Blazanov? Yuri braces himself, gritting, wincing, grunting. Arthur fires one shot into Yuri's abdomen. Yuri lets out a horrible shriek as he clenches his gut. He's in a pool of blood now and sinking deeper. In the car, Pritchett looks to Mary for a reaction. Jesus. Mary looks surprised and climbs out of the car. Arthur, meanwhile, is out of patience. You're done for. It will take a while if you're as tough as you think you are, and it's going to hurt like bloody hell the whole time. Unless I end it. He aims at Yuri's head. He will find you. You will not win. Arthur fires and walks away from the corpse. Mary and Pritchett meet him in the driveway. So, would you like to tell me who these men were? Emissaries of the man who stole the original artifact from me. The enemy, Mr. Pritchett. Well, today they became my enemies, too. You'll fund us then? Pritchett looks at Mary. I'm not just funding you. I'm joining you. That catches Arthur and Mary by surprise. That's not necessary. I have a reliable crew. It's not negotiable. If you want my money, you get me as well. We've lost men already. I can't guarantee your safety. Pritchett looks around at the wreckage and the gaping hole in the front of his mansion. Can't you guarantee it here? Mary frowns. Are you certain you're up for it? Pritchett smiles. I'll try not to slow you down too much. I'm sure you'll prove it indispensable. Interior, airplane hangar, office, day. Arthur, Mary, and Pritchett are in the office of an empty private hangar, gathered around a steel conference table. 
What if there were an element, something foreign to this planet or as yet undiscovered, that is capable of affecting our environment and our physiology, a force that sparks biological evolution in the obvious physical world, yes, but also intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, it would expand consciousness, guide us to new realms of understanding. Such a force might offer an explanation for the advanced civilizations of the ancient era. I believe that whatever constitutes this artifact elevates consciousness the same way lower gravity does to our bodies. Arthur opens the large leather portfolio, a bit crispy on the outside, but still intact, and displays it on the table. It shows a simple world map. He folds down the next page of the portfolio, like a transparent sheet with lines and arrows over the world map. Wind currents. Arthur nods. He lays down another sheet that has similar printing in a different color. Ocean currents. He lays another. Migratory patterns tracking the spread of species over centuries. And another. Tectonic movements. And another. Electromagnetic fluctuations. The map of the world is now covered in crisscrossing lines running all over each other. Arthur speaks with passion, barely stopping to breathe. A pattern emerges. Small ripples spread and echo in opposition to the Earth's natural rhythm. I've tracked spikes in mutation, birth rate, lifespan, developments that should take thousands of years, but have only taken centuries. Look how far the human race has come in 2,000 years, against a four billion year old planet. After more than 50,000 years on Earth, modern man has gone from primitive to evolved. Stones to satellites, these shifts have massive impacts on ecosystems, economies, evolution. Whoa, wait, hold on, what is... Arthur continues, scarcely registering interruption. In the past 12 to 18 months, corresponding with a class 2 magnitude plus solar flare detected by the IG, we've seen dramatic spikes in the effectiveness of the artifact's power. See here. He flips a page, now showing lines of dramatic peaks overlapping the earlier, more subtle ones. This caused a disruption in the Earth's magnetic field on the scale of a thousand gammas, a significant cosmic event causing power surges, outages, and incredible aurora borealis. You must have been aware, no? Well, this space storm, so to speak, allowed me to finally track the near precise location by triangulating... Arthur, for Christ's sake, is he always like this? Mary nods. Bridget takes a deep breath. He looks from the pages to Mary to Arthur. Look, believe it or not, I get it, I think. This is how you discovered the artifact, right? Arthur lifts his steel case, opens it, and lays it flat. The foam lining of each side perfectly surrounds several sensitive instruments, some like the ones we saw earlier, and some new ones, including a Geiger counter. Arthur lifts that section out of the case, revealing a secret compartment below it, containing the lead box. We recovered this 2,000 kilometers west of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean. He opens the box. As soon as he does, all of the devices in the case go wacky, beeping and redlining. They stare at the artifact in wonder, captivated. What was it doing there? It once lived in Athens. In the late 17th century, it was absconded by a well-funded mercenary who intended to take it to the Americas, perhaps on the very same mission we are about to undertake. He didn't make it. Bridget nods, resting the heavy burden on his mind. And the mission? We depart from Belize City and from there into the jungle of the Yucatan Peninsula that once held the ancient civilization of Maya. That is where the final artifact rests. You're completely nuts, you know. All visionaries are accused of that. Bridget looks at Mary. What about you? You a visionary too? I'm a pragmatist and a patriot. Right. You're saving the world. Exactly. So what can I do? Say no? You could just cut a check and wash your hands of it. That would be noble enough. Or just the latter. No one would think any less of you. Sweetheart. They couldn't possibly think any less of me. And I couldn't give any less of a shit. But that doesn't matter one goddamn bit. Pritchett walks over to a footlocker against the wall and finds a bottle of medicine. <coughs> Here's to the future. May we all find our fortune. He drinks and passes it. Arthur takes a sip. Mary, too, grudgingly. Now, tell me about our crew. Exterior airplane hangar, Dawn. The private hangar has its massive door agape and hosts a decommissioned Strukov YC-134 military aircraft, a riveted steel behemoth with massive propellers, broad wings, and a low muscular profile. A few vehicles are also parked inside the hangar. An old Willys truck, a couple of sedans. 
Pritchett stands at the entryway to the hangar, pulling his aviators down against the rising sun. He watches as bodies move, the equipment is loaded. Eno Banco. Inu Banko, 45, a hard-faced, broad-shouldered African man with scars and dark eyes, meticulously checks his khaki rucksack and steel case before securing it. His cargo is mostly weapons and accessories. Pistols, ammunition, knives, rope, first aid kits. Big game hunter, guerrilla fighter, and covert operative during the war. I've yet to find a man or beast that frightens him. He'll act as guide and security. Bridget scans the hangar. A woman passes into view. Celeste Barbeau. Celeste Barbeau, 40, has auburn hair pulled into a tight bun. Her pointed features and swift body language show confidence and character. Transportation, a seasoned pilot, mechanic, equestrian, engineer, a member of the French Resistance. Celeste inspects the plane, her trained eyes covering every inch, hands running over each rivet. And lastly, for excavation, brothers Shea and Colin McLean. These guys are suspiciously absent from the hangar. As Irish as they come, but without any real allegiance, mercenaries, really. Bridget looks back outside the hangar. We hear the distant rumble of an engine. A jeep races into view, accelerating as it gets closer to the hangar, blaring some Elvis Presley rock and roll. Arthur walks up next to Bridget as the jeep approaches. Nearly on time. They're the hardy type, often drunk, tough as hell. More war buddies? No, I met them in Algiers, actually, at a casino. Bridget gives Arthur a raised eyebrow. A long story. The jeep does a wide J turn and swings to a stop a few feet from the hangar as the McLean brothers pile out of it. Shay McLean, 34, is behind the wheel. A thick red beard hides most of his face, the rest of it covered in sunburns and sunglasses. He cuts the engine and the music. Colin McLean, 26, hops out of the passenger seat before the jeep even stops, swinging off the roll bar and landing in front of Arthur and Pritchett. He has long, well-kept hair, a few days stubble, and bubbles with energy. Sir Calloway! He shakes Arthur's hand. Colin, please, you could make it. This isn't some sly British way of scolding me for being tardy, is it? I'd like you to meet Mr. Pritchett. Pritchett extends his hand. James. Colin shakes it. Shay walks to the back of the jeep, picking up some bags. Ah, uh, okay. A pleasure. Pritchett, shall we get this bloody show on the road, then? Colin has a wide smile. He turns to see Shay approaching, just as Shay tosses him a large duffel bag. Shay walks past Arthur and Pritchett without a word. Don't worry about him. Tied one on last night after his lady got a bit too friendly with another fella. Hung over, heartbroken, all that. Hmm. What are we waiting for? Colin brushes past them, looks at the plane, and whistles. Well, she's beauty, ain't she? As the team prepares for liftoff, Arthur turns to Pritchett. You said you owe Mary. Why? Hmm, I'm surprised she didn't tell you. On second thought, I guess I shouldn't be. Arthur grunts involuntarily. She told me you were an acquaintance who may be inclined to help. An insufferable one, but a wealthy one. I didn't think to ask, beyond that at the time. But now, that we'll be spending some time together, I feel compelled to know more. Perhaps I shouldn't have asked. Easy, old man. It's nothing obscene. When she was a nurse in Korea, she saved my life. Jump right off the deck of a battleship, if you can believe that, to put me in a life raft. I developed one hell of a crush on her, as you could expect, but, well, she had other things on her mind. Arthur's face shows a mixture of pride and surprise. Do me a favor, Mr. Pritchett. Remember the mission. Don't get distracted. I am, Major. Arthur turns towards the hangar. Wheels up and fire, everybody. Let's move. Briefing in flight. Interior airplane day. The aircraft only has two compartments, the cockpit and the body. The body is lined with bench seating, built-in storage units, and netting. The group is gathered around Arthur, except for Celeste, who pilots the plane. You've all read Mary's briefing already, so you know the basic parameters of this mission. I've narrowed down our target location to a 15-kilometer radius in the rainforest adjacent to the Saibon River. Arthur unfolds a map and runs his finger along a major road until he reaches a point near the river. This entire area of the map is green, indicating jungle. Fifteen kilometers? In the bloody rainforest? You can't see ten meters in that brush. Yes, it's tough terrain. The region is largely unexplored. No aerial photography, no accurate topography. It won't be easy going, but once on the ground, we should be able to guide us. Aye, let's hope so. We'll need to be prepared for all 
types of indigenous wildlife and the excavation of an archaeological site. You will not, I repeat, you will not disturb any discoveries until consulting myself or Mary on how to proceed. We're dealing with volatile materials. All of that. I would elaborate if I could. Now, any more questions? Yeah, why not more men? Mary shoots him a glare. I mean, personnel, supplies. You have to admit, this is a bare bones crew for this type of trip. No reinforcements, extraction, guides. You'll have to trust me. The smaller the circle, the lower risk to everyone. You were each chosen for your skills, your discretion, and your loyalty. Those are all paramount to our success, and there is no room for failure. Right? Couldn't be that you got booted out of the Royal Army, lost all your privileges, and you're left with the free market rejects? Arthur looks at Shay. Son, are you loyal to England or to me? Shay thinks for a moment. The paycheck. Then what does all that matter? Well, I can smell a suicide around a hundred miles away. I tend to come home from these missions like this with all my arms and legs still attached because I do my homework. And because I avoid the desperate long shots. Do you want to back out, Mr. McLean? Have you lost your will? Maybe I value my neck more than my reputation. Arthur looks over to Colin, who nods in concert with Shay. Doubly right. Both of you. He looks at Shay, who holds eye contact for a moment, then nods. Pritchett looks to the rest of the group. All of you. But no more bitching. He locks eyes with each one of them, and each of them nods. Pritchett looks to Mary next. She nods, grudging gratitude. Exterior, Belize airstrip, day. On a poorly kept airfield surrounded by high rainforest canopies, the team deplanes and unloads essential equipment. Superimpose, Belize. Pack light, only what you can carry for many kilometers through unforgiving terrain. Inu unpacks a bulky case and straps on a heavy square backpack with a tube and nozzle coming out of it. Is that what I think it is? Inu nods. What the bloody hell would we need a flamethrower? Inu speaks perfect English through a thick Nigerian accent. Have you ever faced down a big cat? Or a silverback? Colin shakes his head. A pistol won't stop them. A shotgun might kill them, but not in time to save them. And in the dead of night, do you want to see the predators coming, or do you want to shoot in the dark? This weapon makes me the predator, and then the prey. Well, just keep a few steps away from me. While the team loads into the truck, Arthur stands sentry, carefully inspecting the roads, airport, tree line. Pritchett approaches him. So how likely is it we encounter our competition again? If they track me to Virginia, they can surely track us here. That's why we must move quickly. Blazinov. He understands the artifact the way you do. He and I were part of a small group tasked to study the first artifact during the war. Every one of those men has died except for him and I. It's part of him, just like it's part of me. Richard checks his pistol and secures his gear. I can't know how far their research in espionage has gotten. Blazinov is ruthless, intelligent, and well-respected. They watch Inu clip the nozzle of his flamethrower to its tank, sheath a machete, holster a pistol on his belt, and sling a shotgun over his shoulder. Yeah, but we got that guy. <laughs> Exterior, jungle, day. Midday in the Central American rainforest. Thick, wet air. Every shade of green. A canopy 150 feet high teeming with wildlife. Echoing sounds of strange creatures coming from every direction. It's like another planet. Arthur leads, the rest of the group following dutifully. Everybody sweats through khaki or military attire. Mary is near the rear of the single file line, followed by Pritchett, a bit out of breath and struggling to keep up. Mary notices. Maybe a cigar and gin will set you right. You said it, sister. She shakes her head. <clears throat> if your goal was to impress me, you're falling short. Nah, just needed some fresh air, you know? I'm starting to get stuffy in that old house. He ascends a hill behind her, his eyes set on her rear end as she climbs it. And the view here sure is hard to beat. Mary stops abruptly and turns towards him. You know, there's a reason I never answered your letters. Only one? Seriously though, Mary, I'm not the same person I was then. Clearly. And it's Miss Calloway to you. She resumes walking up the hill. So how'd you get tangled up in this mess, Miss Calloway? Growing up with art as your dad? Does that just automatically pull you into a life of adventure? What, potty training, then knife throwing, followed up with some light espionage? Father ne never gave me that kind of direction. Ah, uh, yeah, I bet he was too busy for all that. 
diving into the ocean for lost treasure. His work is massively important, Mr. Pritchard. It has taken his whole life to reach this point. It will be his legacy, and I won't let you belittle it. Legacy? You Brits are always so concerned about what people will think of you when you're dead. What we accomplish, and what we leave behind, it's everything. It's all that matters. What would you have us do? Toss away the fortunes of others and complain about it all day? Pritchard chuckles. That's good. You really got my number. Bloody joke to you. I'm just saying, maybe try living a little bit before you die. You know anything about living. You're squandering your life, and you haven't got the faintest idea. So that's it, then. That's why you never wrote back? You think I'm some kind of lazy idiot? She stops and turns to him again. I think you're a waste. You don't do anything. You don't believe in anything. You just exist. Comfortably. What should I believe in? What do you believe in? I believe in my father, but I believe in what we're doing even more. This has an incredible time to be alive. An age of unprecedented discovery and intellectual growth. If we manage not to implode, humankind can emerge as our evolved species, capable of wondrous feats. That's a responsibility for all of us to take on. Great men and women carry that burden. Well, it's not boring, I'll give you that. But the truth is, you really don't know what we're charging into, do you? Einstein, you've heard of him, right? He said the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. The answers will come when the time is right. That's never. She resumes walking. Pritchett smiles. Dissolve to exterior, jungle, dusk. The team moves slowly, fatigued. Sweat soaked through their jungle gear, scraped and smudged from branches and bugs. A sign of a destination, Major. Arthur takes a reading from his Geiger counter as he walks. There's interference. We need to keep moving, find higher ground. Hi, lovely. Shay walks up next to Colin. Suppose the air up there gets too thin. You won't be able to shit your mouth off. That'd be a shame. I, I hate to say the right thing to the wrong one. Shay grabs Colin by the collar. Arthur watches out of the corner of his eye. Shut the hell up, you little prick. Colin chuckles. I learned it from you. All's fair, isn't that what you said? Shay pushes him away. Boy, you're getting yours after this mission is over. We're having this out, you hear me? Aye, I look forward to it. Arthur stops at the crest of Small Ridge, surveying the team as they approach behind him. Set up camp. Relieved, they begin to set down for the night. Dissolve to exterior jungle night. The team sits circled around a campfire. Arthur remains on the ridge a dozen yards away. A torch is stuck into the dirt next to him, casting light onto his journal and instruments as he continues to crack away at the mystery, frustrated. Mary approaches and offers him a tin mug of tea. You should shut your eyes. You haven't slept for days. I'm fine, dear. Arthur accepts the tea and makes a small sip. You're not invincible, you know. There's something I'm not seeing, or something I'm failing to recall. Some essential piece of the puzzle. A cipher. Key. Well, just remember to look up every once in a while. I'm afraid we're going to lose you in there. Arthur looks up to her, his pale, his eyes surrounded by deep, dark rings. It's getting harder to focus, to stay grounded. You've taken on too much. You need to sleep. Give me the artifact. Let me carry it and you can rest. Arthur shakes his head. It's not safe. And I won't be able to rest until I finish this. Look at you. You won't make it. It doesn't matter. The work must... It does matter. You know I love you, dear. Once we get through this, everything will be different. We can change the world. Nobody can finish it besides me. Don't you want to be part of the new age? The enlightened age? I want you to be part of it. We'll be fine. I promise. She takes a breath and pecks him on the cheek. Don't be long. Arthur returns his attention to his notebook as she departs. He sighs and lies back, watching the smoke from the torch waft towards the trees, drifting into the night sky. Cracks in the cluttered canopy allow Arthur to see glimpses of the stars, and even a crescent moon. His eyes dart around them as he tries to settle his mind. Then he shoots upright. Of course! He pours his canteen over the torch, dousing it. He finds his monoscope and points it towards the sky. From here, he can only catch glimpses. The light from the campfire pollutes his view. He heads away from the camp, stepping up periodically onto a rock or tree trunk to see the stars. Finally, he gets a good view. He's looking for something specific in the sky. He roots around his pack again and pulls out a star map. He traces it until he finds the constellation of Orion. He pulls out an atlas, studying it closely. He checks his watch. It's close to midnight. In a frenzy of inspiration, he flips through his journal, scanning measurements of temperature, barometric pressure, and more. He copies the measurements onto the atlas. After a few furious minutes of transcribing, he grins. Brilliant! Exterior, jungle camp, night. 
Mary, Pritchett, Celeste, Inu, Colin, and Shay are gathered around a small smoldering campfire. He's not exactly as I remember him from Africa. Sort of cracked a bit, isn't he? He's obsessed. But crackpots always pay the best. Show some goddamn respect, Irishmen, bunch of drunken boys. And just how is it you know Major Calloway? You two old bedfellows. Old friends. I have a bit of a habit being loyal to my friends. Aye, well you can stop right there then. There's something this fuck doesn't know shit about. Colin scoffs. Don't mind him. He's a sore loser. Shay stands and grabs Colin by the collar. Aye? May I ought to show you what a loser looks like? Branches crack and leaves a rustle in the trees surrounding their camp. Everyone goes silent. They reach for their weapons. In the dimness beyond the clearing, tall trees sway. Strange shrieks echo through the forest. There's something out there. Monkeys? Branches twenty feet in the air crack and fall to the ground. If that's a monkey, I'm a bloody pope. Pritchett looks to Enu for, for confirmation. Enu shakes his head. Shay looks to Mary for answers. Just what the hell is out there, Miss Calloway? Exterior, jungle, nearby, continuous. Arthur stuffs his map into his bag. A shriek from the canopy behind him catches his attention. He sits quietly for a moment, scanning the jungle. He hears more signs of movement. Rustles, crunches, then footsteps. He creeps through the foliage until he reaches a hillside, which descends below him. He squints through the darkness, then sees something. Bloody hell! Alarmed, he turns quickly and sees a Russian soldier standing over him. The Russian swings a rifle butt into Arthur's face. Exterior, jungle camp. Pritchett kicks dirt over the fire. We need to move. Now. My father, he's... A shrill shriek from the canopy cuts her off. Celeste loads a flare gun and fires it towards the canopy. They all watch in stunned silence as it arcs into the trees. The flare lights up three sets of glowing green eyes attached to large leathery bodies more than seven feet tall that cling to the trees above the camp. Run! The three figures begin detaching from the trees and spreading huge leathery wings. Colin, Shay, and Inu open fire into the trees as the team scrambles out of the clearing. Shrieks cut through the forest while these large, gray, feathered, sinister hawk creatures descend. They dive and leap adeptly through the trees like eagles hunting prey. Beneath their wings are arms and legs coated in thick leathery skin and feathers. Flat, thick, wide tails support their weight as they push off from the trees. Bridget keeps his eyes on Mary, darting between trees, grappling for traction in the slick terrain, making sure he doesn't lose her. A hawk creature descends upon Shay from behind, wrapping its arms around him and digging claws into his chest. With Shay in its grasp, it lifts off, using its tail to spring off the ground when it flies into the trees. Colin fires as Shay screams. He's quickly consumed by the darkness of the canopy, followed by slashing and shrieking before Shay's mutilated body falls back to earth. Colin screams in rage, firing into the trees as the creatures swiftly evade his bullets. Shay! Celeste grabs Colin and pulls him into thicker brush. Inu swings his shotgun around and fires at the closest hawk creature, covering Colin and Celeste as they retreat. Colin and Celeste duck into the brush. All three hawk creatures land simultaneously, surrounding Inu, towering over him. He fires into the chest of the closest one, tearing it open. As it squeals, the others encroach. Inu pumps his shotgun, but one creature slashes at him, sending the shotgun clattering to the ground. He draws his machete as the two remaining hawks converge. Exterior, jungle, nearby, night. Arthur is shoved against a tree, his arms bound behind his back. He turns to lean his back against it. His face is swollen, blood running down his cheek from a wound above his eye. As he lifts his head, he sees a platoon of well-organized Russian soldiers surrounding him, at least 30 of them. They part ways and allow Glazunov to approach. He stands in front of Arthur for a moment, waiting for him to meet his eyes. Arthur complies. Get on your knees. Never. Glazunov punches him in the gut. Arthur jolts and wheezes and falls to his knees. I'm very disappointed, Galloway. I expected much more from you. Just added, Glazunov. If only it were that easy. Glazunov addresses the soldier nearest Arthur. This bag. The soldier holds up the confiscated pack. The artifact. The soldier rifles through the bag until he finds a small lead case. Glazunov smiles. And his journal. The soldier comes up with that, too. Retrieve Miss Petrovich. Now, Major, we will need you to lead us to the final artifact. Then I will send you off. Exterior, jungle, nearby, continuous. Pritchett and Mary run through the jungle, Pritchett in the lead, ducking and weaving through the foliage. Mary looks behind her, seeing nothing but trees. Did we lose them? I'm too scared to look. Pritchett jumps over a fallen tree and skids to a stop. Ten years ahead, a handful of Russian soldiers head straight towards them. As soon as they spot Pritchett, they open fire. Mary ducks behind the fallen trees as Pritchett dives over it and hunkers down next to her. 
its bark torn apart by bullets. I think they found us. He pokes his head up over the tree and nearly gets it blown off by a barrage of bullets. Mary yanks him back down. Stay down, you'll get killed. Thanks for the tip. They both check their pistols as the gunfire gets closer. Exterior, jungle, nearby, continuous. Gunfire is audible in the jungle. Lazanov kneels down next to Arthur and speaks into his ear. Do you hear that, Major? That is the sound of my men decimating your team, your family, your legacy. Arthur ignores him, wearing a glazed expression. Your misfit team has no chance. They feign loyalty is no match for the discipline of my trained forces. Exterior, jungle, nearby, continuous. Richard and Mary exchange desperate looks as four Russian soldiers approach from the other side of their shelter. They may try to take us alive. Over my dead body. Mary nods. You ready? He cocks his pistol. She nods and does the same. They take a deep breath. Gunfire comes from ahead of them, opposite the soldiers. They duck, but the bullets aren't aimed at them. They can barely make out Colin and Celeste, crouched in the darkness, picking off the Russian soldiers one by one until all of them are down. After the field is clear, Celeste and Colin emerge from their cover and join Mary and Pritchett. I sure am glad we brought some professionals. Professional or not, we're bloody well fucked out here, aren't we? Fucking Russians? Are you kidding me? My father. Have either of you seen my father? They shake their heads. Ew, Shay? They shake their heads again, more grimly this time. We'll double back, keep low and quiet. Maybe we can stay out of sight long enough to find your father. You're a man. There's God knows what behind us, and God knows how many Russians, God knows where. What's your plan then? Dig a hole and sit in it? We'd be a lot more safer than hiking back to the mouth of the madness. All right, shut up. Come on, let's think about this. You think? I'll drink. Colin produces a flask from under his shirt and takes a big swig. Pritchett puts his hand out. Colin passes it to him, and Pritchett takes a long sip as well. You just became my new best friend. Major Calloway ordered us to complete the mission, no matter what. There is no mission without him. She's right. Load your weapons and get ready to move. We're going after him. Exterior, jungle, nearby, continuous. Arthur staggers back, slamming against a tree. A fresh wound on his bruised face. Dazed, he tries to shake it off, but he falls back to his knees instead. I feel myself driven towards an end that I do not know. As soon as I have reached it, as soon as I shall become unnecessary, an atom will suffice to shatter me. Until then, all the forces of mankind can do nothing to stop me. Napoleon, a brilliant general. But you, Blazinov, are a hero. Your pride and vanity will undo you. Power comes from faith. Faith knowing your destiny and accepting it. I know my destiny, Major. Do you know yours? Do you really think you're in control here? Lazanov turns to a soldier standing nearby, Artyom equipped with a rocket launcher. He puts his hand out, and Artyom hands him the familiar lead case. Lazanov opens it and looks at the item inside, the artifact. Do you know what this is? Pandora's box. Hmm. This is power. We are not a primitive society that worships myths or fears the supernatural. We are the masters of our own fates. We can harness great power. We will harness this and it will mark an historical epoch, a turning point in the history of man. Lazanov holds it close to Arthur's face, demanding that he behold it while he speaks. This will not only win the Cold War for me, Major. It will win me the world! Arthur spits in his face. Lazanov winds up and punches Arthur. Arthur slams against the tree behind him, momentarily disoriented. Lazanov expertly settles his adrenaline, and Arthur slumps into the dirt. Help my scientists navigate to the final piece. That will spare your daughter's life. She can take care of herself. There is no glory to be found here. This is not courage. It's denial. You must know that I will find the artifact with or without your guidance. You do this for what? A nation that turned its back on you? You're narrow-minded. It's not for them. Not for England or a coat of arms or glory or some silly idea of victory. A brainwashed, dogmatic thief like you would never understand. It's for my fallen brothers, the unborn children, the good of humanity, the endless possibilities for all mankind. And you are blind to reality. Your idealism does not serve you or anyone else. This is entirely selfish. You want the thrill of discovery. You want answers, just as I do. The most human of desires. Lazanov thinks for a moment, then reaches into his belt and pulls out a slick, smooth, black lead case. He opens the case and shows Arthur its contents. The other artifact. 
it's been many years since you put your eyes on this, but I know it never left your heart. I know you have always felt its presence like I have. It is no coincidence that you and I are here today, together. Arthur turns his head and looks at it for a moment before Blazanov seals the case. And look what it has done to you. Your exposure has broken you. It has made you weak in mind and body. Only a shadow of the brilliant man you once were, that I have become stronger, and I have yet to achieve my fullest strength. That is what I will find at the end of this journey. What will you find? Lazanov hands both artifacts to Artyom. You think you're a god? You are nothing but a thug. Lazanov raises his arm to punch him again, but he's interrupted. The soldier sent to retrieve Mrs. Petrovich returns with Ivana. She sees Arthur, bound and beaten, and pauses. Arthur looks up and they lock eyes for a moment and share a strange look and charged moment, but she snaps out of it quickly. He's an old man and you've beaten him half to death. He's barely conscious. He'll be useless. We do not need his body, only his mind, and what's left of it. The soldier hands Ivana Arthur's journal. Lazanov steps back as she approaches. Major Calloway. Arthur looks at her sheepishly, with something like a grin appearing on his bruised, dazed face. I can see the frequencies in between. I can see the atoms in the air, parting for me. Major? They will take us home. Ivana looks to Blazanov, and grunts. We got too late. He's too far gone. Ivana puts her hand under Art's chin, holds his face steady, gets up close, and looks into his eyes. You must remember, Major, you must. There must be some kind of, of key to decode the path, something that will guide us. Arthur's eyes roll around until they focus back on her. Vous avez, vous avez record le bois de Boulogne, Ivana? Ivana nods. In French. Vous, vous êtes même la femme que je sais? She drops her gaze for a moment, catching her breath. Oui. Arthur smiles slightly. This is what he wanted to hear. Lazanov grimaces, uncertain about this. Do you remember swimming naked in the Seine after the liberation? Our bodies were one with the water, the air, the sky, the stars. We all blended together in a cosmic dance. Tu m'as montré les constellations. Do you remember them? She nods, choking back her emotions. Exterior, jungle nearby, continuous. Celeste, Pritchett, Mary, and Colin creep carefully through the brush, scanning their surroundings and staying low. As they approach the Russian camp, they hear the sounds of people talking and moving. Celeste signals for the others to stop. Mary pushes forward, peeking between the trees. Pritchett stays close to her as they sneak up to the camp. She finds a low branch and lifts herself onto it. Pritchett follows. From there, they can see through the trees into the small clearing where over 30 Russian soldiers are gathered, on edge, weapons ready. Arthur, Ivana, and Blazanov are at the center of the group. Exterior, jungle, nearby, continuous. Ivana scribbles furiously on an empty page of Arthur's journal, while Blazanov paces impatiently. It was arrogant to believe the solution would be terrestrial. Arrogance is the folly of man. This is the heritage of gods. I've heard enough. This is nonsense. Blazanov draws his pistol. Colonel, it is not nonsense. Look. Ivana kneels and spreads an atlas over her knee. She unfolds Arthur's transparent star chart and lays it over the atlas. She orients them carefully, checking against measurements in Arthur's journal, checking her watch and her compass. She uses a wax pencil to trace a line on the star chart, showing a path through the jungle. This is it. This is the way. She nods. I believe so, with the destination here. She circles a location of high elevation, deep in the jungle. Then we are done with him. No, we may still need him. Miss Petrovich, if I still need him, then I no longer need you. This is not a military mission, Colonel. It is not an assault on our enemy position. You said it yourself. It's a mystery. We have no idea what we will encounter or how we will deal with it. But he may. He has an intuitive understanding, a relationship with the element, something that we cannot quantify. Whatever secrets he once held are lost inside his head. It's time to set him free. Intercut between Mary and Arthur. Blazanov puts his pistol against the back of Arthur's head. Colonel, stop. I beg you. Ivana kneels next to Arthur. The hunter in the heavens will soar above his prey, invincible in the bosom of his ancestors. Arthur's eyes drift towards Ivana in a moment of lucidity. Continue the work. Step away. Ivana reluctantly complies. This is the downside of valor, Mrs. Petrovich. Blazanov fires. The bullet blasts through Arthur's head. He falls to the ground, limp. 
Dead. No! Blazanov and his team swivel towards the source of the scream. Oh shit. Pritchett stands and starts firing into the camp. Celeste and Colin also start firing. Russian soldiers immediately return fire in their direction. Mary's in shock, frozen, looking at her dead father, face down in the mud in a heap of tattered, bloody clothing. Pritchett grabs Mary by the shirt and pulls her down. The two of them jump from the tree as it gets torn apart. Mary tumbling to a stop, still in shock, gasping, Pritchett on top of her. Come on, we gotta move! She shakes her head, trying to come back to reality as Pritchett sticks his gun out, firing and hitting a Russian soldier in a nearby brush. No! We have to go back for him! Colin and Celeste come up on either side of them, firing towards the Russians, who steadily advance towards them in between the trees. Get your asses moving! Pritchett stands and extends his hand to Mary, who still can't seem to function. Take my hand. Right now. Everything else later. She nods, takes his hand, and the four of them run in the opposite direction of the Russian barrage. They sprint and weave through the dense, dark, pre-dawn forest while the wave of Russian soldiers takes pursuit, totaling more than a dozen men. The soldiers alternate in groups in perfect practice military order, advancing, finding cover, firing on the fleeing enemy, and continuing to advance. Bullets rip through the brush all around them. The stunned, fatigued team slips and stumbles through the unfamiliar terrain, and the Russians steadily gain ground on them. We can't outrun them! You got a better idea! Celeste swivels, firing, taking up the two closest Russians with three quick shots. Gunshots graze Celeste's arm, two soldiers ten yards away. Celeste runs full speed, the rest of them alongside her, as the Russians begin flanking them on both sides, still advancing in waves. Pritchett and Mary, in the lead, come to a sudden stop when they hit a sharp decline in the terrain, steep enough to send them tumbling in an uncertain fate. Shit! Form up ranks! The four of them gather in a tight circle, backs pressed together, weapons aimed into the darkness. Each takes a turn to fire at any movement, and there's plenty of it, in addition to approaching gunfire. A bullet grazes Pritchett's ear. One hits Colin's forearm. Fuck! Shit! The Russians close in. A wall of flames burst through the darkness, a steady stream of fire sweeping from left to right. The flames engulf the pursuing Russians and every bit of jungle around them, leaving Celeste, Colin, Pritchett, and Mary untouched. Enu steps out of the brush, his flamethrower spraying fiery hell into the tightly organized soldiers, every one of them either on fire, fleeing, or firing shortly before being engulfed. Enu's destructive weaponry wipes out the soldiers in seconds. He clips the spout back to the tank as he steps through the flames towards his team, like some demon emerging from the flames of hell. A soldier in his path rises on the ground and screams, his torso aflame. Inu swings a shotgun around and fires, ending the soldier's misery. There are more close behind. We must move quickly. I vote we do whatever he says. Which way? Colin looks to Pritchett, to Inu, to Celeste, to blank faces, and finally they all look to Mary. Mary attempts to calm her adrenaline. I... I... I don't know. He was the guide. He knew the way. Bloody hell. How far away are they? Two kilometers at most. You three keep a lookout. Give us a minute. That may be all, all, all we have. It's all we need. Enu sets himself up to one side while Celeste and Colin go the other way. Celeste begins dressing Colin's wound. Mary shakes with adrenaline and grief. Hey, look at me. She can't meet his eye. Tears block her vision. He embraces her. She shoves him away. Get off me. Bridget puts his hands up in the air, submitting. Okay, okay. We'll never complete the mission now. His work. His life. It was a waste. He'll never know the truth. Stop. Can you forget the damn mission for a minute? She hides her face. He steps closer, gently puts his hand on her shoulder. You've had a shot. The bottom fell out, right? Well, that doesn't mean it's over. You keep fighting, no matter what. You don't understand. I don't? Are you, are you sure about that? <coughs> Do I not know what it's like to live in someone's shadow? She stops, swallows, collects herself. Look, we don't have a lot of time, so there's only one way this works. Now's the time when you pull yourself together and become the person you're meant to be. No mentor, no safety net, just you. That's all we need, you. How? I don't know the way. You're a Callaway, goddammit. The answers are in your blood. Pritchett lifts up her chin, looks into her eyes. We don't get to choose what we inherit. Usually it's a burden, but it's also a strength and spirit. It's a part of us that lives between the flesh and bone and blood. Reach inside, Mary. You've got an ocean of it. She takes a long, deep breath. The fog clears, her composure returning. Maybe there's more to you than I expected, Mr. Pritchard. Jane. There's definitely something out here. Miss Barbeau, do you have a map? Celeste joins Pritchard and Mary. They kneel as she spreads an atlas over her knee. I advise we continue southwest. Mary inspects the map as Celeste shows the path they have taken thus far. Southwest for the road for 20 kilometers. 
This here, she points to a small peak in the topography. The ruins of Caracol. Yes, fully documented in your debriefing. Uh, and here, a uh, Calic Mule, the ancient city. Yes, but we are... Bridget shushes Celeste. She shoots him a dirty glare. Sorry, she's on to something. Mary's deep inside her head. The wheels are turning. The hunter in the heavens. That's it. Come on. Orion, the hunter. The astrological figure whose orientation figured into the theology of the Mayans. Mary rifles through a pack until she finds a folded, worn star chart. She traces the Orion constellation. She pulls out a utility knife with a ruler printed into the handle. She focuses on Orion's belt, the three most prominent stars in the constellation, and carefully measures the distance and orientation of the stars. She translates the, her measurements to the atlas, placing three round marks on the atlas, one for each star. The marks make an off-center line, just like the markings on the artifacts. Two marks center exactly above the two points she just mentioned. The third point is deep in the unexplored jungle. Here, directly south. Celeste and Pritchett exchange looks, confused or impressed. Maybe both. There is a theory of correlation of Orion to the development of many ancient civilizations, particularly the Mayans and the Egyptians. The orientation of the Giza pyramids reflects it. It also matches the markings of the artifacts themselves. Here, it is the foundation for the planning of ancient cities. Bridget lets a slow grin spread onto his face. Good enough for me. Let's move, boys. It's still dark as hell. We're as likely to follow our deaths as make any headway. Celeste folds up her map while Mary pockets her star chart. We've got an hour until dawn, two at most. That's all the head start we'll get on them. If we're lucky, we can retrieve the final artifact and get out before they arrive. The group tightens their packs and preps for the march. Lead the way, Miss Calloway. Exterior, jungle, morning. A regrouped Russian platoon marches through the jungle. Two armed to the teeth soldiers out front, followed by Blazanov, Ivana, and about 20 remaining soldiers, including Arsium. Ivana keeps an eye on a compass and atlas as they proceed. Exterior, jungle, day. Mary leads Enu, Celeste, Pritchett, and Colin through the thick brush. She wields Enu's machete to clear away the brush. Each of them is covered in sweat and showing serious fatigue. Mary hacks at a cluster of fronds ahead of her. She continues hacking as the brush gets thicker. She stops, signaling to the others to hold their positions. She kneels in the thick brush and wipes dew from wide leaves. She proceeds forward a few more steps into thicker brush and wipes a thin slush from the leaves. The team looks at it, and at her, confused. She finds a small steel compass in her pack, flips it open, and holds it in front of her. The needle spins continuously. They all watch it, confused. Mary puts it away. There's a thick bramble of ivy ahead of them. Mary swipes at it with a machete, clearing a path. A burst of air rushes out, like a warning. We're close. The team hesitantly moves forward. Exterior, jungle, day. Blazanov leads his troops through the dense terrain. It's thick enough that they march single file, or two by two. Ivana is close behind Blazanov. Her arms are full, and her head is buried in paperwork while she marches. She has Arthur's notebook in front of her and a folded map covered in notations. How much farther? I believe she scans her notes. Miss Petrovich, I am losing confidence in your abilities. Perhaps you should execute me. Blazanov grunts. He stops and turns to her. He is a monster. But know that there are few men in the world capable of doing the great things which must be done. I have my responsibility to my country and to history. You have your own. The readings are escalating, temperature and barometric pressure fluctuating rapidly. We are close. Good. Exterior, snow forest, day. Mary hacks at a thick frond covered in slush. It splashes back at her. Enu, Celeste, Pritchett, and Colin stay close. The canopy grows thicker, allowing very little sunlight to reach the ground. It gets dimmer as they proceed. And it's actually getting cold here in the jungle. A steady breeze blows at them, and they each show the shifting temperatures in turn rolling down their sleeves, shivering, even puffing out steam with their breath. Soon, Mary notices snowflakes drifting in front of her face, a spare few at first. She regards them with curiosity. The ground gets slicker, wetter, a thin layer of slush sits on top of the mud. Mary looks up and sees a blanket of clouds ahead of them, thick fog resting well below the canopy, and, drifting down through the hazy, floating fog, snow, real, fluffy, white snow, they move forward, all realizing that it is snowing. Each team member pauses to witness it falling in front of their faces, each as shocked as the next. As they continue, the snow gets thicker. There's a covering of it on the ground and the brush and trees. Exterior, snow forest, continuous. Mary pushes through a thick line of snow-covered brush to bring them into a shifting landscape. 
The thick tropical trees recede behind them, replaced by thinner trees sporting twisted black bark. The rainforest vegetation still thrives, but it's more spread out and thicker, larger, appearing almost mutated, as if it adapted to the sharp change in weather. She hands Inu his machete, which he sheathes at his waist. They push farther ahead. There's an even covering of six to eight inches of snow now, and it falls continuously from the clouds above them, inside the canopy. Mary turns to see the astonished faces of the crew. They have powder on their shoulders, packs, faces, an odd sight to see a sweaty, bloody crew in camo, covered in snow. I don't suppose this is a good sign? Mary searches for encouraging words. Whatever we find ahead of us, remember the mission. Remember my father. They reply with slow nods. A shriek from the sky. A dark figure with wings the size of a man rips through the clouds overhead, then disappears. Colin draws his pistol and grips it tightly. Not this again. Another shriek comes from the clouds, and then more. From everywhere, amidst the fog above them, dozens of sets of green eyes glow. They form a tight circle, weapons ready, and scan the fog. A rumble, a permeating sound similar to a growl, creeps up through the thick air. They search for its source. Visibility is low. A sharp crack comes from the south. They all turn their heads and weapons towards it. They hear and feel thuds and thumps in the distance, shaking the ground slightly. Earth-shaking thumps get louder and closer and faster. Snow falls from the trees. Something big is out there. A silhouette takes shape in the fog, low to the ground and running towards them, maybe 30 yards away. Snow kicks up in a frenzy. Leaves and branches crack and fly out of the fog and brush. Oh, sweet bloody hell. It barrels towards them from straight ahead, its massive size and speed coming into focus. Run! Everybody run! Celeste takes a knee and swings her rifle around as the huge figure rumbles closer. She aims and fires. Eni raises a shotgun and fires. The beast bursts out of the snow and fog. On all four legs, it stands 15 feet tall, with its body stretching to 60 feet long. At first glance, its long body looks like a jaguar, but it has the thick musculature and lighter coloring of a polar bear. Its underside is rough, black fur, and the rest of it is grayish white with a spotted pattern. Huge tusks emerge from its short, bear-like snout. A thick, strong tail covered in white fur swipes left to right as it lunges towards them. Celeste and Inu's shots hit, but they don't even slow it down. In a second, it's upon them. The group scatters. A massive paw strikes the earth amidst the group. Colin's leg is crushed as he is thrown to the ground. Each of the others barely avoids being crushed as they scramble out of its path. The beast swipes at Mary. She rolls away and sprints for the cover of the trees as the beast slides in the snow, turning itself back towards its scattering prey. It lets out a horrendous roar. The hawk creatures descend in huge flocks. All hell breaks loose. Exterior, jungle, continuous. Nearby, where the rainforest is still warm, the Russian platoon is gathered. Lazanov kneels in the thick brush, his hands wiping a thick, cool slush off of a wide, flat leaf. As he inspects it, the roar echoes from the forest ahead. Lazanov stiffens. He turns towards Ivana. The Alpha. Ivana holds her breath, trembles slightly, and nods affirmation. Lazanov surveys his men, who share frightened expressions, but stand ready to proceed. Standard formation. Weapons ready. Stay on target no matter what. This is when you show the world the strength of Mother Russia. Lazanov draws his pistol, pushes aside the thick wet brush, and marches ahead confidently. Exterior snow forest, continuous, intercut between team members. Celeste picks up powder as she fights for traction in the snow. She throws herself over Colin as the beast's massive tail sweeps overhead. The beast ignores them, its sights set on Mary, sprinting in the other direction. Celeste turns Colin over. He groans. His wounded leg is bent underneath him, covered in blood and bent at an odd angle. His pack lands in nearby, much of its contents spilled, including several sticks of dynamite. Celeste stuffs the dynamite back into the pack and grabs Colin by the shirt. He grunts and shouts as she drags him through the snow. Are oh, you fucking bitch! Shut your mouth! A hawk creature swoops nearby. Celeste barely avoids it. Bloody fucking hell! She drags him to a spot behind a group of trees where a ditch has formed in the roots. She pulls him into the ditch. He lands, a broken pile of flesh, cursing, staining the snow with his blood. He coughs, spitting blood, and gags. Fucking hell of a way to bite. Celeste pushes his arm out of the way of his abdomen. His whole torso is bruised and crushed, blood welling up inside and oozing out of a gash at his waist. You have internal bleeding. A shriek and roar sound too close to sit tight. We have to move. I ain't going nowhere, you know it. Colin pulls a handful of dynamite out of his pack, leaving the majority inside. He hands the pack to her. Next thing comes for me. Man or beast ain't gonna know what it is. Celeste nods. Go with God. Colin laughs. He finds a pack of cigarettes in his shirt as Celeste climbs out of the ditch. 
No other team members are visible through the snow and fog, just gunshots and growls. She runs into the fog as Colin strikes a zippo. Elsewhere, Mary is tossed up against a large tree by one of the beast's arms as it pivots. Her shirt torn open at the shoulder and showing a nasty scrape. She shakes off the impact, but not fast enough. She tries to bring up her weapon, but cringes at the pain of her fresh wound. The beast reorients itself and bolts at her. Pritchett steps in front of her, leveling his Colt 45 and firing rapidly. A few bullets hit the beast, but they don't stop it. It's almost upon them. Shotgun rounds call its attention from behind, zipping over its shoulder and grazing its face, singeing its fur, striking its back leg, and sending it into a panic. It veers off track and spins around to see Inu already reloading. It charges him. Inu runs. Pritchett pulls Mary into a covered area behind a large stone and kneels next to her. He notices the wound on her shoulder. She notices him noticing. I'm fine. Of course you are. That was pretty stupid, you know. You brought me along for my money, not my brains. Mary laughs, winces. Look out! Another figure appears behind Pritchett, swooping down from a tree, slicing through the snow, and holding above them for a moment, as if levitating. Pritchett turns around just in time to look him in the face. He swings his forty-five around, but the hawk scratches at him with its long, thin claws, and Pritchett drops it. Mary raises her pistol, but not before the hawk wraps Pritchett under one of its huge wings, digging his claws into his back and climbing rapidly up the tree using its arms, tail, and legs. Mary fires, but misses. Across the clearing, Enid runs as fast as he can, hacking at any brush that gets in his way with a machete. The beast tumbles after him, knocking everything else out of its way as it bears down. The beast rears up and slams its front legs down, shaking the earth and sending Enid tumbling to the ground. It pounces on him. He rolls out of the way quickly enough to avoid being crushed. Its paw lands on the nozzle to his flamethrower, crushing it. Enu instinctively reaches towards his hip, producing a knife, and swiftly stabs it into the creature's paw. It recoils, giving Enu a chance to roll out from under it and run. The beast catches its breath only for a moment before it charges after him. Enu takes a tight corner, wrapping himself around a tree and changing direction. The beast slides and stumbles, then plants its massive claws into the earth and finds its footing, only a slight interval behind Enu. Nearby, Pritchett, in the hawk's clutches, scrambles for a grip on anything as it whips him upward through the fog. As they get higher up in the tree, the hawk's claws dig deeper into his back, drawing blood. It takes him out on a long branch and leaps, simultaneously wrapping him up in both arms to free its wings, and they soar. It flaps its wings and pulls him above the fog, above the canopy, and he can see the expanse of the jungle for a moment until they dive. Pritchett grunts, rides, and wriggles his arm into his belt as the hawk connects with the tree, his legs wrapping around it for a pit stop. Pritchett's knife is sheathed at his waist. He gets a grip on it and slides it out. Pritchett screams as he yanks his arm vertically, with the hawk's claws sliding down his back. His blade slices through the hawk's chest, and it shrieks. The shriek is audible close by, where Enu continues his desperate sprint. Enu slides in the snow and slams into a tree. The misstep gives the beast nearly enough ground to pounce. He turns towards the beast, his back to the tree, machete in hand. One last stand. Celeste hurls a stick of dynamite at the beast from its side. The stick slides into the snow and simmers for a moment, then explodes, kicking up mud and dirt and snow at the beast's side as it charges, knocking it off course. Enu sheds snow and dirt from his clothes as the beast recovers, shaking off the debris. Enu turns towards Celeste. They make eye contact, but she doesn't wait for a thank you. She reaches into her pocket for another stick and lights it. She raises her arm. A hawk creature dives down from the trees. It wraps her in its arms, digging its claws into her, and in one smooth motion lifts her and carries her away. Inu sprints towards her, but it happens too fast. The hawk ascends with Celeste into the trees, and he loses sight of her in the fog and leaves. Seconds later, an explosion and shriek, and Inu sees bits of blood and gore fall through the fog. Gunfire erupts from behind him. Inu ducks behind a tree as bullets bounce into the snow all around him. Russian soldiers are in the snow forest and have spotted him. They move in an orderly line, firing at everything that moves. Blazanov is at the center of the platoon behind the front line, barking orders. Maintain the line, forward! The beast spots the Russians and charges, scattering their group as bullets pierce its thick outer layer of skin. It stomps a handful of them who can't move fast enough, swipes several more. Blazanov takes cover behind a tree, narrowly avoiding it. Sprays of blood dark in the snow. Screams are muffled by the fog and forest. A frenzy of growls and gunfire emanates. Enu bolts in the other direction, grateful for the diversion. In another part of the jungle, Pritchett takes a rough tumble down the side of a tall tree knocking through branches and brush as he grapples with the wounded <coughs> hawk. The two of them hit the ground hard, cushioned slightly by the snow, which partially buries them. The hawk throws itself onto its back and uses its tail to swing back up, its claws and teeth springing straight for Pritchett's throat. 
Pritchett whips his knife at the approaching creature, and it spins forward, then sticks into the hawk's chest, digging in deep. It shrieks and falls on top of Pritchett. He throws it off of himself, grabs a thick fallen branch, swings it high above his head, and brings it down onto the hawk's head repeatedly, with blood spraying up at him, spattering onto his clothes, arms, and neck. Eventually, the hawk's face is mostly pulp and mangled bone, sinking into what remains of its skull. Pritchett raises the branch a final time, stopping with it in midair when something directly ahead of him catches his attention. What the hell? A giant snake, 20 feet long and as thick as a tree, with a hooded head armored like an armadillo and spikes coming out of its nose, <coughs> lunges at him. He holds the branch in both hands horizontally in front of him, blocking the massive jaws as they snap down and send him flying onto his back. Close by, Mary frantically reloads her pistol, her back against a tree for cover, her arm shaking from adrenaline, cold, and a fresh wound. Creatures scurry all around her, kicking up snow. More hawks swoop overhead. She runs toward the nearest tree, surveying the field from behind her. A dozen yards away, she spots a mutilated soldier lying face down in the snow. His rifle lies next to him. She bolts for it and scoops up the rifle without stopping as she sprints past the dead soldier. A shriek from above, a hawk swoops down on her. She dives to the ground and drops the rifle. The hawk attacks, talons first. It wraps huge claws around her abdomen as it hits the ground, grabs her with an arm, and flaps its wings to take off. She kicks it in the gut. It recoils, but keeps its grip on her waist. It flaps its wings and picks up speed, dragging her through the snow. She wrenches her body and turns towards the ground, grasping at the snow as the hawk lifts her off the ground. A couple feet in the air, her hands throwing snow everywhere. She gets a grip on the rifle. She gets one hand on the stock, one on the trigger, turns at the waist, and fires, hitting the hawk in the chest. Blood sprays all over her. She shuts her eyes as they fall 15 feet to the ground, landing in a pile of snow and limbs. The hawk flails on the ground. She kicks it away, stands up, and shoots it again, leaving very little of its torso intact. She raises the rifle and holds it ahead of her as she continues walking. She lets out a long breath of relief and readies herself for the next obstacle. She hears a sharp whistle nearby. She jerks her head to see Inu signaling her, approaching in complete stealth, already within a few feet. He carries his machete in one hand, knife in the other, shotgun hanging around his shoulder. His blades drip blood. Miss Calloway. He crouches next to her. She sees his clothes and face are completely covered in sprays of blood. Are you... Not my blood. He crouches beside her and removes the flamethrower from his back. Broke. She picks up the nozzle and inspects it. I think this is beyond the repair. Inu nods. I need your help. Inu sets the flamethrower on the ground and begins unfastening the straps. What are you going to do? Hunt. Near Colin's ditch, a group of three Russian soldiers moves in tight formation, scanning the forest, jumping and aiming at every strange sight or sound. As they come upon the ditch, each in turn raises their weapon and points it down inside. The ditch explodes, consuming the soldiers in a forceful cloud of smoke and shrapnel. Not far away, Pritchett is tossed against a tree forcefully. He spins away from it into the snow. The snake strikes, narrowly missing Pritchett and hitting the tree, splintering the bark. Pritchett rolls to his feet, holding his branch like a baseball bat, knees bent, ready to swing. His adrenaline pounds. Come on. Come on, you little shit. The snake coils up and flares its fangs. It strikes. Pritchett holds the branch vertically and steps to the side. As the snake strikes, its jaws snap down on the branch, its fangs digging into the wood. Pritchett is thrown to the side as the snake tumbles to the ground next to him. He finds his feet, holding empty hands in front of him and balling them into fists, ready for another strike. The snake twitches. The branch is stuck in its top fang and bottom jaw, wedging its mouth open. It flails violently, kicking up snow. Pritchett dodges it as it rides around. He finds his knife in the snow nearby and dives for it, then waits for his moment. He pounces and sinks the dagger into the snake's neck, just below the jaw, on the unarmored side. The snake twists, and Pritchett wraps his arm around it, wrestling it and pushing the knife deeper. He yanks his arm to the side, slicing the snake open at the neck, leaving its head dangling from its body. It spasms a few times, then dies. Pritchett stands above it, trying to stand straight, trying to catch his breath. You'll make a nice pair of boots. Then he sees the fang buried in his abdomen. With all the adrenaline, he didn't even notice. It's small, not big enough to be life-threatening. Pritchett removes it and tosses it on the ground. The wound bleeds a little. His vision blurs. He staggers a bit. Whoa. He takes a step and trips, but catches himself. He drops his knife. An ear-shattering roar comes from nearby, followed by loud thumps that shake the ground and rattle the snow. Much like the beast's first appearance, Pritchett sees trees bending and fog wafting away as the thumps get louder. Pritchett pivots, tries to take a step, but stumbles and drops to one knee. The beast comes into view 30 yards away, charging at him. 
Give me a break. A dozen yards to Pritchett's left, Enu has strapped a live flare to the flamethrower's tank. He runs towards the beast and swings the tank by the strap, hurtling it in the path of the beast. It arcs high, then sinks towards the ground. Just before it hits the snow, gunshots come from nearby. Mary is perfectly positioned, firing her rifle at the tank. She empties the rifle, but hits the tank. It explodes just as the beast comes upon it. A wall of flames erupts in front of and underneath the beast. Pritchett lifts his head to see the wall of flames erupting and sticking to the beast as it barrels through them. Its green eyes and flaming fur make it look like some kind of monster from a nightmare. He blinks at it, only barely able to process the sight. The beast is disrupted by the explosion and stumbles in the flames. Its front legs fail and it goes face first into the snow, sliding and tumbling forward. One of its front legs is completely torched. The skin is gone and black charred flesh hangs out. Its chest looks almost as bad. Its face is burnt, but snow smothers most of the flames as it falls. It settles to a stop and on its stomach a couple yards in front of Pritchett. Its legs scratch at the snow and earth, trying to get traction, but it's too weak. Its body is failing. Its giant head, the size of a car, is right in front of Pritchett. They lock eyes. Its jaw moves. Fur smolders. Pritchett stands with great effort and takes a few steps forward. He reaches his arm out and calmly puts his palm on its head between the eyes and pets it. A rumbling growl emanates from its throat, but it doesn't buck. Its breath slows and its eyes shut. Shh, time to rest. Pritchett's hand slides off of the beast's head. He looks at his hand, confused. He staggers back and falls into the snow. James? Inu and Mary run over to Pritchett, finding him collapsed on the ground. His eyes are glazed, his body weak. Inu spots the dead snake nearby and inspects Pritchett's wound. He reaches into his utility belt and finds a small sleeve with a disassembled syringe inside. He begins putting it together. Screams and gunshots from the Russian platoon continue to fill the air. Mary kneels next to Pritchett. You're going to be fine. Yes, Miss Calloway. Mary smiles. Mary. Inu pokes Pritchett in the leg with a syringe. What's that? Anti-venom. But it may be too late. Or not enough. We gotta do something about this guy's attitude. They hear soldiers in the snow nearby, barking orders. Gunshots still ring out through the snow forest, punctuated with screams and shrieks, but it's hard to tell where they are or who's firing. We must keep moving. Mary nods. James, we're going to get you on your feet. I'm tired. Don't go to sleep. We've got to get you up. Mojito? Right, this way, I promise. Mary and Inu lift him to his feet, and suddenly he's standing face to face with a dead beast. They're not so scary. Voices, footsteps, gunshots encroach, filling the forest. Quickly! A strong wind, packed with snow, sweeps down at them. There's an incline that gets covered in fog and flurries as it climbs. The lack of visibility looks a lot like safety. Inu and Mary prop Pritchett up between them as they hustle through the snow, deeper into the storm. They struggle against the steep incline and sweeping winds. This is the vortex. We're approaching the eye of the storm. The battle sounds recede. The snow gets thicker and heavier. It blows side to side at wicked speeds. The hill gets steeper, almost mountainous. The snow gets heavier and hail mixes in, striking like pebbles. Pritchett struggles and stumbles, falling to his knees. Mary helps him up. He continues on. Soon there are no longer any trees. The fog and snow become one soupy gray froth. It gets darker. Exterior, plateau, continuous. They reach a plateau and each of them climb onto it. The wind and snow still whip at them, but just ahead it stops, abruptly. They proceed into the gray fog and the snow starts to settle. It's still here but it's not whipping anymore. It floats in the air in front of them. Against the gray blanket of thick air, bright white snowflakes hang, looking like stars. As Mary moves through the snow, she puts her hand out in front of her. She pushes the snow back and forth. It moves around her, reacting to the changes in the air. She's momentarily mesmerized by this strange atmosphere. There's an odd stillness that causes uneasiness in them. They exchange baffled looks, but no one can offer any words worthy of this strange environment. As they continue on, the floating snow dissipates. They proceed into thick, dark fog. Visibility is almost zero. Exterior, ruins, night. Mary is the first to break free of the fog into a large courtyard. In here, it is night. Stars fill the sky. They each emerge from the fog in turn. It floats behind them, drifting in a gentle circle surrounding the courtyard, like a floating nebula that stretches all the way up into the sky until it mingles with the stars. Ahead of them are the ruins of an ancient temple. The exterior walls of the temple are mostly intact, having once consisted of large slabs of stone. They tilt inward slightly, suggesting the structure was at one time pyramidal, perhaps coming to a point at the roof. Each of the four sides is equal in length at about 30 feet. In some places, the walls have crumbled <coughs> to six feet in height. 
In other areas, they still stand at 10 or 15 feet. There is an entryway ahead of them, a high arched doorway surrounded by stone with a few stone steps leading up to it from ground level. The arch remains, but nothing above it. Through it, they can glimpse the interior of the temple. Mary proceeds towards the temple without a word. Inu and Pritchett share a look of disbelief, then follow. At the base of the temple, Mary pauses. She looks at Inu before proceeding. Stand guard. Inu nods. Mary hands him her pistol. Pritchett and Mary proceed into the temple. Interior, temple, continuous. There is no roof in this large room of about 30 by 30 feet. The crumbling walls bear intricate carvings of many human and animal forms. The temple is covered in ancient myths. It's dark, but there is a translucence permeating the surfaces, perhaps from the bright moon and shimmering stars. Mary loses her breath when she sees the far wall. Opposite the door is a recessed area about five square feet with a large stone slab composing its back wall. Unlike the rest of the walls, the slab is completely intact. The walls of this recessed area are scorched, but the carvings remain perfectly visible. A big border contains celestial iconography, sun, moon, stars. At its base, it contains a familiar carving which includes a royalty figure surrounded by complicated machinery, similar to the lid of the tomb of Kinich Janab Pakal. The constellation of Orion is the centerpiece of the slab. The stars that compose the constellation are represented by jewels embedded in the wall. An artistic interpretation of Orion, the hunter as a mythological figure, is carved and painted around them. Amazing! They proceed into the room, entranced by the art covering almost every inch of wall space. What the hell am I seeing? Mary proceeds to the western wall, inspecting the images. She points to a carving of a tree. This is the creation. Here, the mother tree. These carvings are thousands of years old, and here... She points to an area of the wall with three spiral symbols above the mother tree, laid out in the same formation as Orion's belt. The three hearthstones. The configuration is identical to Orion's belt, the same as the Temple of Teotihuacan and the Pyramids of Giza. Like on the artifact? She nods. The constellation of Orion is the basis for the Mayan creation myth. Many believe the pharaohs travel back to the birthplaces of man upon their death the place before and after life, and that the temples and the pyramids were not tombs, but spiritual vessels. Mary crosses the temple, inspecting the image in the recessed chamber. This was a tomb, but there is no coffin, no body. They were sent home. She traces the border of the carving, touching the jewels that compose Orion's outline. Orion holds a shield carved from concentric rings of various minerals, spiraling to a central core. The center ring is solid matte black and contains two empty square cavities. Here, the shield, these minerals, some of them are indigenous, others are from all over the world. Obsidian, limestone, diamond, this looks like meteorite. They figured it out. This configuration is this orientation with the Earth's magnetic poles. So, where's the final piece? I hate to ruin your buzz, but we're a bit tight on time. It's here. It's all of this. This chamber's final piece, it's a launching pad, and the artifacts... Pritchett steps forward, inspecting the cavities. Are the keys. Mary smiles. Very good, Jane. I guess that spoils our plan, then. You know, getting out of here with the artifact before the Russians pulverize us. Mary's sense of wonder evaporates. I don't suppose you've got some new trick up to a sleeve. Pritchett shrugs. See a rodeo. Inu bursts into the temple. Get down! A rocket-propelled grenade zips out of the fog, followed by a high-pitched whistle that raises in pitch as it approaches. Everybody dives to the floor and covers their heads. The rocket strikes the front wall to the left of the doorway, blowing it apart at the top. Rocks and rubble cascade into the temple, narrowly missing the team, all closer to the far wall. As the dust settles, Mary picks her head up and shakes off debris. She sees Enu closer to the door, coming to his feet. Pritchett is a few feet away, unconscious, covered in debris. She pushes herself up and drags herself towards Pritchett. A deep rumble bubbles up from the earth, accompanied by vibrations in the earth, quickly building to a tremor. The temple shakes. Mary falls flat to her stomach for the duration of the quake, watching as the stones comprising the temple floor beneath her vibrate and separate. It lasts about five seconds before subsiding, and she continues upon the loose stones toward Pritchett. Another high-pitched whistle fills the sky. Down! Inu dives on top of her, covering her with his body, just as the eastern wall explodes into rubble. Inu and Mary, miraculously alive and conscious, roll out of the renewed dust and dirt. He'll destroy it all. He doesn't care. He just wants the element. He knows it's indestructible. We have to get out of here. Inu scurries towards the entryway, peeking outside. Too late. Exterior, temple, night. 
Glazunov, Ivana, and about six soldiers, perhaps the entire remainder of the Russian squad, have come through the fog and stand a dozen yards from the temple. Glazunov shouts through what remains of the archway. If there are any survivors, know that resistance will be met with further destruction. Go to hell, Boris. Interior, temple, continuous. Mary looks at Pritchett and grins, pleased to see him rolling out of the debris in one piece. Sorry. Why don't you handle this? It's everything my father dreamed it would be, Blasinov. You mustn't destroy it. No man should have such power. Pritchett checks the magazine and his pistol. I'm empty. Inu checks the shotgun. One round. Shit. I will destroy it, Miss Galloway, and you along with it. You will bury the prize, the answers. Exterior, temple, continuous. Then I will excavate them from the ruins. Blasinov nods to Artyom. He gets down on one knee and aims his rocket launcher through the archway at the centerpiece of the temple. Destroy them. Yinu stands in the doorway, exposing himself momentarily, and fires, hitting Artyom. Artyom falls as he fires, the rocket launches, spinning and spiraling into the fog, into nothing. Yinu, out of ammo, ducks back behind the archway. Blazanov turns to his men and barks one explicit order. Take the temple. His men charge forward. Interior, temple, continuous. Pritchett pushes himself to his feet. He runs over to the doorway and stands beside Inu. They get in. We're dead for sure. Inu brandishes a machete and knife. He hands Pritchett his shotgun. Empty. Who needs bullets? He holds it by the barrel, ready to swing it like a baseball bat. They each stand on one side of the doorway, waiting for the barrage. And it comes. Soldiers rush through the doorway. Inu slices the throat of the first one while Pritchett bashes his knees. He goes down hard. The next two soldiers charge forward. Inu throws his knife, connecting with one soldier's chest and sending him falling back onto the onslaught, tripping up some of the others. Pritchett swings the shotgun at the next soldier, but he deflects it, and the two start to grapple. Inu swings his machete down and chops off the hand of a soldier who charges through the doorway, rifle first. Shotguns startle the air. They rip through Inu's torso. He breathes heavily, blood pouring out of his wounds. Blazanov's gun still smoking. Inu raises his machete and charges the remaining soldiers. He decapitates a soldier before Blazanov fires again, hitting Inu point-blank in the heart. Inu flops forwards, dead. The two final Russian soldiers tackle Pritchett. Pritchett flies backwards, falling hard into the stone. No! Blazanov strides in with confidence, Ivana close behind. He lets his pistol hang at his side as Mary speaks. You have no idea what you're dealing with. This is beyond the comprehension of man. The soldiers subdue Pritchett and strike him hard in the face. He shouts in pain. Blazanov points his pistol at Mary. Stop! Please! I can help. I can translate. I know how it works. There is a device. Can you activate it? It would not be wise to attempt it, Colonel. Is that what I asked? Ivana crosses the room past Mary to examine the far wall. She finds the shield and feels the grooves. Blazanov approaches Mary. Activate it. You know nothing. This is a temple to honor the remains of kings, to serve the dead to make souls eternal and transform rulers into demigods. Lesnov sheathes his pistol. His soldiers restrain Pritchett, who struggles with what little strength he has left. You are as arrogant and timid as your father. Mary slaps him in a knee-jerk reaction. Lesnov laughs. <laughs> your father understood, as I do, that these pieces are part of our heritage, our blood, and our destiny. Fear and apprehension have no place here. Bring the artifacts. Blazanov breaks away from Mary to meet Ivana. He withdraws the two boxes from his belt. He opens each of them. As soon as the artifacts are exposed, the walls shine with translucent texture. The stars in the sky grow brighter. The whole temple is suddenly bathed in ultraviolet light. It illuminates intricate inscriptions covering every inch of the temple's walls. The carvings and paintings almost seem animated as they glow with natural light. The shield in the chamber glows along with the markings on the artifacts. Magnificent. They all stare in awe, overcome by the beauty and magic. Ivana finds the two dark spots in Orion's glowing shield. Here, two empty cavities. Lazanov passes her the artifacts. She holds them next to the wall. They appear to be the correct size and shape. What will happen when we insert them? I have no idea. Lazanov takes the artifacts back from her. Ivana steps out of the chamber and stands next to Mary. I urge you to let me study it before you do anything. Expeditious. Uh, we may be able to gain insight into... Into what? Look around you, Doctor. Look at the sky, the forest, the air. This is not a place for science. There are no logic or laboratories here. There are no nations either. No politics, no nuclear weapons, no war. Just men and women. And gods. Plasanov lines the artifacts up with the cavities and begins sliding them in. Colonel, don't! 
He turns towards Ivana and Mary. If you have faith, Miss Petrovich, then you have nothing to fear. Lazanov pushes the artifacts into the cavities. A wall of light appears. It completely encloses the recessed chamber. A thunderous boom shakes the temple. The onlookers stagger back. The brightness is intense. Lazanov stands behind the wall of light. Within it, he glows in there. A purple aura surrounds him. It vibrates. The shaft of light flickers and disperses. The temple shakes. The energy overtakes the whole scene in small bursts. Pure, perfect light is intermittently broken with silent darkness. For a moment, everyone floats in a vacant abyss. Streaks of light, bursts of stars, planets, nebula. A cosmic backdrop cuts in, takes over, consumes the scene. They're all floating. After several moments of cosmic chaos, the light focuses within the chamber again. The onlookers drop to the trembling temple floor, disoriented, finding their footing. Blazanov, within the chamber, vanishes in a bolt of light. Baffled witnesses stare at the scorched walls and struggle to regain their bearings. And before their eyes can readjust, a low rumble comes from deep within the earth. It escalates quickly in seconds. It feels like a full-on earthquake. Pritchett seizes the moment. He elbows one stunned shoulder, sending him reeling backwards. The other soldier releases Pritchett and runs from the temple, too overwhelmed to consider his duties. The temple shakes around them, stones tumbling from the walls. The floor becomes uneven. The stones that comprise it are slowly separating. The earth beneath the temple is shifting. Pritchett locks eyes with Mary. Ivana still stares into the chamber, trying to fathom it. We have to get out of here. A violent tremor knocks each of them to the floor. As Mary picks herself up, Pritchett claws his way over to help her. They each rise to their feet with great effort as the temple quakes. It's all they can do to keep from falling over. Pritchett takes Mary's hand. Come on. The artifacts! Mary separates from him and steps towards the chamber, her arm outstretched to retrieve the artifacts in the wall. A chasm appears in the middle of the temple, splitting it in half. The floor opens up. In an instant, all three of them are sucked into the earth. Interior, earth, night. Stone and dirt mix with mud and water as Pritchett, Mary, and Ivana fall through the bowels of the ancient temple. Icy water tosses them around, knocking them along the sides of steep terrain as the earth quakes and trembles. They have no concept of where they're heading or how fast they're going. They're at the mercy of the earth. Exterior, river, day. The earth spits them out of a gaping wound in the hillside, propelling them through the air towards a rushing river. The strong current of the, of the wide river froths and flows over sharp stones. Splashes of white water bubble up. Pritchett shoots up to the surface, gasping for air. The current moves him swiftly as he fights to stay afloat. Pritchett splashes around frantically as he searches the river. He winces and clutches at his side. Pink water surrounds his blood-stained shirt. He takes a breath and ducks back below the surface, fighting the current and searching through the rough, rumbling water. He comes up again after a few moments, having found nothing. He scans the area as he fights to stay above the surface. Finally, he sees Mary floating face down a few yards ahead. As he watches, he sees Mary sink below the surface. Pritchett takes a breath and dives. Mary's limp body gradually sinks towards the bottom of the river as the current pulls it along. Pritchett kicks frantically, pulling himself along with every bit of strength he can muster. He closes in on Mary. The river hits a sharp bend where Pritchett catches up to her. He grabs her by the arm and pulls her towards him, clutching her to his chest. I've got you. I've got you. He kicks towards the shore and manages to drag both of them onto the dirt. Before catching his breath, he searches for signs of life. He listens to her chest and airways, but he's still coughing and heaving himself. Mary! Mary! James? She coughs and sits up. He smiles and sighs a huge breath of relief. I guess this makes us even. Pritchett plants himself in the dirt next to her. You still owe me a mojito. Ivana pulls herself onto the shore, gagging and coughing. Pritchett finds a branch and wields it as a weapon. Stop! Wait! I'm not your enemy! That accent says otherwise, Natasha. I am a scientist, not a soldier, and I knew your father, Miss Calloway. You let him die, I saw it. I had no choice. Ivana steps closer, cautiously. She sees Pritchett heaving, close to doubling over. She reaches into a pocket in her cargo pants and pulls out a small leather notebook, Arthur's journal. I'm on your side. She holds it out for Mary. Mary grudgingly accepts it. Pritchett drops the branch and crumbles to the ground, barely able to breathe through the pain and exhaustion. Let me look at your wound. Pritchett untucks his blood-soaked shirt as Ivana approaches. He cringes and lies back on the ground. Ivana kneels beside him and peels his shirt to the side to show a jagged, bleeding wound. He grunts. Don't be a baby. Ivana tears his shirt and uses it as a rag to wipe the blood away from the wound. You will live. That's a relief. Mary sits in the mud, cradling the journal in her hands. She flips through it, poring over Arthur's notes. Ivana watches out of the corner of her eye while she treats Pritchett. Try the last page. Mary flips to the back of the book. The ink runs a bit from the water, but it's still legible. 
from Mary, my life's work. Blood rushes to her face as tears fill her eyes, fade out. Exterior, Fairlawn Cemetery, Sussex, twilight. Eerie bagpipes wash over the serene landscape, singing Amazing Grace, a lush green cemetery where white headstones send long shadows from the setting sun. Dozens of cars line every paved pathway along a crowd of dozens of well-dressed people, many in military uniforms from many nationalities. Mary hides her face behind a veil. Pritchett is in his military dress whites, perfectly pressed and adorned with a few medals, holding his cap under his arm. Ivana is there, too, all cleaned up in formal attire. A priest gives a blessing. A coffin is lowered. The Royal Army gives a 21-gun salute. People line up to offer their condolences to Mary, each man and woman sharing some spectacular story for the man whose name is on the headstone, Arthur Calloway. Pritchett attempts to make his way towards Mary, but the crowd is too thick. They make eye contact a dozen yards apart. Dissolve to exterior Fairlawn Cemetery, dusk. Pritchett and Mary sit on a familiar bench as the crowd disperses. The first stars appear on the darkening sky. Familiar constellations come into view. Cassiopeia, Leo, Orion. They look at the sky as they try to find words. You ready to talk about what happened out there? We touched a higher power, traveled between the constituents of matter, tapped into the central nervous system of the universe. That's what I was going to say. I just, you know, wanted you to confirm it. She smiles. Well, what's next then? Back to work? Your father wouldn't take kindly at all this sitting around. There's a lot of questions left unanswered. A lot of work to be done. And that can wait a bit. Fancy a bite first? I'm famished. Pritchett smiles and stands. He extends his hand to her, almost like he's asking for a dance. She accepts and stands in front of him. He looks into her eyes and slowly pushes the veil aside. He kisses her gently. They separate and look up at the stars. They gaze past the dusk and atmosphere into the eternal cosmic abyss where stars take the shape of men and drift amidst the serene majesty of the universe. Fade out. The end.